I am a 72 year old man. This happened a long time ago, but I remember it very well. The background was a series of events that placed me in a mountain cabin outside of Frederick, Maryland, circa 1970. Just say my life at the time was disarray. I had dropped out of college, my father had died very badly, and I was alienated and needed to get my mind right. The opportunity to move to an isolated cabin to live in contemplation and solitude was welcome. I had some inheritance money to pay for it. To the best of my memory, I was there eight to nine months. No TV, but books and radio. I had a library card and can't remember if I had a phone. The story begins when a month into my stay, a female beagle showed up at my door. She was a lost dog. I took her in. Never could train her to do anything, but I fed her and she was sweet, if not the brightest dog. A few months in, I began to feel a presence around the isolated cabin. Hard to describe, but I felt like someone was watching. On many occasions, I thought someone might even be looking in my cabin window, watching us. The next phase was the shadowing or following. I knew the folks a half mile down from the lane, woods all around, and would sometimes visit them at night. Someone or something was waiting for me and followed closely in the woods beside me in the darkness. You could hear it easily, footsteps in the woods, and it picked up its pace as I did. This not only happened to me, but my younger brother who visited and to friends, and it spooked them big time. At night, it was out there around the cabin, but here's the funny thing. I was never afraid and never felt threatened, not at all, at least not early on. There was no feeling of malevolence. I spent a good bit of time wandering the vast area of woodlands around me. There was a state park just up the hill and the Frederick Municipal Forest went on for mile after mile. The whole of Western Maryland was much more countryside than it is now. None of the development had started yet. In our hikes, the dog and I came across evidence of campsites, recent ones in the woods, traces of fire, old abandoned buildings that had corners and gave shelter and looked slept in. Garbage, food and drink, paper, what have you, perhaps hunters, but much of it did not have the organized feel you get from experienced hunters. The last month of my stay there was when things intensified. Maybe he sensed I was preparing to leave. In the morning, I would find small dead animals at the bottom of the front steps. The cabin had a small front porch, screened with a light door and four wooden steps to the ground. A spotlight would illuminate the long front yard with woods close by on either side. Dead animals began to appear at the steps many mornings. I remember small birds, then a squirrel, a rabbit, and even a weasel one day like they were offerings. I had to grab them up before the dog ate them. And this went on for almost daily for several weeks. One night very late, I was awoken by some sound. I lay in bed and heard something from the porch. I hopped up and hit the lights and saw that hound dog who never learned to sit or stay standing at the front door in a perfect point position. She was shaking in fear. She never barked and I heard the door slam and footsteps down the steps. I hit the spotlight but saw nothing. I went out. He had been at my front porch, maybe trying to enter. After that, I stayed in at night more and more. The animal offerings got bigger and bigger. Large birds, a possum, a woodchuck. It wasn't funny. The final two gifts were legs from either horses or cows, big and bloody. One was skinned. The second to last day, the dog left me. I could hear her in the woods howling on the trail following a scent. I looked for her in every way I could. Came up in following weeks, but to no avail. She left as she came. I moved back to the Maryland suburbs of DC, got an apartment with a friend, got a job and moved on with my life. One day, not long after I picked up the Washington Post and there was an article about a recent encounter 
with the Sykesville monster. It described a tall Yeti-like creature fur covered on two legs that would pick out a family or person and give them attention. I wasn't the only one. The attention described in the article was exactly what happened to me, following you at night, looking inside the house, gifts and so on. I was shocked. If I had turned on that spotlight and seen a Bigfoot or a Yeti, I might still be running. But I think I knew who it was. Sykesville, Maryland was the location of the Springfield Hospital Center, a large psychiatric hospital. It was 20 miles or so east of Frederick. Back then, many folks knew how to live in the woods. They grew up that way, country folk. I think the monster was an escaped patient or just a free schizophrenic who lived outside. This is like all the homeless you see in the cities now, probably off his meds, but somehow functional and lonely. He would pick people or families to adopt. The camps in the woods could have been him, nothing to do. He would make mischief. I think he liked me, but sensed I was leaving. I can't prove any of this, just a theory. My monster was very much of the time and place, and his behavior was what I noticed in nearly every case then. I do not think he could have survived until the 80s. Deinstitutionalization of the mental hospitals threw the mentally ill out onto the streets and took away the shelter of hospitals and protected the mentally ill die. I am a female and the youngest of a large Hispanic family. My father had a lifetime of adventures and interesting stories, one of which used to give me nightmares when I was a child. This happened back in the early 70s. My father had a rough life and a devastating upbringing. He was short in stature as he was of Japanese descent. He was also aggressive and fearless. He had a don't mess with me kind of attitude. My father was an outdoorsman and he was always armed. He would also indulge in liquid courage, more often than he cared to admit, you get the picture. This particular night took place in Sierra Madre, which is located in the wooded mountains in Mexico where we lived. It was a typical night. My father was horseback riding home, which would take about two hours. In his drunken stupor, he heard someone calling his name from the woods. Tranquil, hey, tranquil. It was a raspy voice he didn't recognize, and although it was too dark for him to see, he wasn't concerned. He replied by shouting back angrily, Who are you? How do you know my name? But he kept on riding. The voice persisted. Tranquil. Hey, tranquil. At this point, the unnerving voice put him on edge. Suddenly, the horse got spooked father was bucked off by his horse who took off galloping into the darkness. Unfortunately, his foot got stuck on the saddle, but the horse continued to ride, dragging him face down. After what felt like forever, his foot became dislodged from the saddle, but his horse did not stop. Catching his breath, he stumbled to his feet, hoping for a swig of tequila, promising himself it would be his last drink. He continued to hear someone calling his name in a sadistic, taunting squeak. Father began to shake involuntarily and felt his heart pounding against his rib cage. Fight like a man. Show your face, he muttered, trembling, not truly meaning what he said. He'd been hoping it was just a bad dream since no one had answered. Abruptly, he felt its hot breath. Before he could do or see anything, he was picked up and tossed a few yards into the air. Whoever, or whatever that was, had massive strength and knew his name. And that made him question himself. Obviously, it was too much for him to handle. Father felt defeated. He knew of his impending doom. Whatever it was, it couldn't be human. Barely conscious, his terror intensified when he heard a horrific high-pitched howl. My father was beyond terrified and admitted to almost wetting himself. If you help me through this, I promise I will stop drinking, he prayed in an attempt to bargain with God. 
but he was barely conscious at this point. His vision went dark, and he collapsed. Waking up, he found himself in a canyon. He was relieved to know he was still alive, but he slowly realized it had not been a dream. He saw his flesh was exposed to the cold wind, and the intensity of the pain throughout his body was excruciating. It was almost dawn, but it was winter, and snowflakes were starting to fall. Moments passed when he started hearing noises nearby. He began to panic. The injured man stumbled to his feet, gathering his bearings, and, without looking back, climbed out of the canyon. Once again, he started making his way home as fast as he could. He knew instantly, recognizing this feeling, that he had been followed. Not just being followed, but being tracked at a great speed. Father was able to feel and hear the creature's noisy breath only inches behind him. He was petrified but kept moving. Even if he wanted to run, he was too wounded. He almost fainted when he would do that. And he kept good to his word. He quit the liquid courage for good after that. I was a teenager, and I just up and decided that I wanted to stay at my great uncle's hunting camp one night. It's deep in the woods, bordering state forest land, and there are gravel roads through most of the mountains in my state, and they're very convenient if you want to camp away from people, but still have reasonable access. The last two miles of the road to his camp are totally washed out, so the last bit of my trip would be on foot, but I was in the mood for a wood stove and a late night walk. The moon was out, and though it wasn't full, it was good enough to see by, so long as I wasn't under tree cover. It was set to be a beautiful night. I told my dad where I was going, and hopped into my tiny 2002 Hyundai Accent and drove off. I eventually got to the turnoff and started into the mountains. I had about 45 minutes of driving in the darkness left until I'd eventually reached the right fork which would take me to the nondescript dirt road that acted as the camp's driveway. There are dozens of roads that crisscross and connect to each other, and often themselves in any given section of state forest land. You can very nearly cross my state using only mountain roads and Amish country. Driving is one of my hobbies, and I know huge swaths of forest by memory. And so, I knew that when I reached a certain turn that I would begin to follow a creek down into a narrow valley. The road was steep enough that I would need to reduce gear. The accent only had second gear to help, where first would have been better, so occasionally pumping my brakes was necessary to keep a safe speed. People tend to go way too fast on these gravel roads and then go sliding off into the trees when they have to evade or slow down. I was averaging about 24 miles an hour when I gently applied my brake and checked my rear view mirror out of habit. And there was some pale, floppy, hairless thing on all fours running about 10 feet behind my bumper, washed in the red of my brake lights and partially obscured by the trail column of dust from my tires and the vibration of my rear view mirror attached to the windshield. It was like my heart stopped. I almost ran off the road right there. I jerked the wheel as I slammed the brakes and skidded a bit. But that loping thing suddenly closed the distance on my rear bumper in a heartbeat. I released a truly horrified shudder and hit the gas out of reflex, which of course meant that the tail lights were no longer illuminating the thing. I cannot accurately describe to you just how quickly I went from perfectly content to the greatest state of terror I have ever experienced. I was gripping the wheel so tightly, I could no longer feel my hands. My entire body was trembling. I was trying to drive with my peripheral vision while mostly glued to the rear view, occasionally stealing glances back to the twisting road before me. I could see hints of motion somewhere in the darkness. I almost ran myself off the road again 
and I literally had to order myself aloud to look at where I was going so that I didn't kill myself. My body was thrumming. I was probably going at 40, and the road straightened out, and the tree cover thinned out a bit, creating patches of pale light. My eyes were adjusting to the brightness of the headlights, so this wasn't much, but it was enough to catch a glimpse of the receding fleshy form still pursuing me. By the next bend, I could no longer tell if the creature was still behind. I did not stop at the road leading to the camp. I didn't stop at the one after, nor the one after that. I kept driving for another hour taking an incredibly inefficient and winding road that eventually led me out of the forest on the opposite side of my home. I had chosen roads that were steep, for instance, because maybe it would slow the thing down and it wouldn't be able to catch up as easily. What I did next was truly irrational, though. I drove for yet another hour on the interstate, then doubled back home using regular roads through the various towns I had passed along the way making big loops and redundant turns. I had not been interested in horror in general up until this point, and this experience awoke something in me. To this day, I will go on night drives and never not feel scared. I was also a fairly skeptical person by nature, so this was also a deeply disturbing experience on a whole other level. And four months later, I saw a picture of a bear with mange on the internet, and suddenly, everything was perfectly clear. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana slash Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun, and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed all our gear in saddlebags and started out. The first night and day were amazing. Beautiful scenery, amazing air quality, and it really was so peaceful out there. I love that area and I wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day, and my cousin said to me, do you want to see something weird? I said, of course, and she led me a bit on the side into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing, and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those that you can plug in or wind up and also acts like a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries very quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like someone buried a transmission wire, but small, 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees, then back into the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally deadens into an outlet. That outlet is mounted to the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm starting to get confused at hell at this point. Why is there a desk in the middle of a forest? When my cousin takes the radio, and pulls out the cord and plugs it into the outlet, it lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were at had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and certainly no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet, weird as hell. 
No spooky jump scares or bodies. Just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I'd have taken a picture of it. Every year, my family has this huge family reunion with hundreds of people that go to the same campground. One of the things that some of us do is a ghost walk. There's a dirt access slash logging road that goes out of the campground and up into the mountains. And even though it's kind of against the rules, we walk up it as a group until we're sufficiently creeped out. Sometimes if we're feeling up to it, we make the one to two miles away from the campground up the pitch black hills. We have a no flashlight rule to help preserve our night vision and add to the creepiness, which comes into play later. This year, the group of about 10 to 15 people had left without me and my stepson, who was 15 at the time. So we decided we were gonna sneak up on them and see how close we could get without being noticed. We tailed them for over an hour on the walk and we're definitely well over a mile, if not two from the campground, sometimes getting within 20 feet of them. As my goal was to sneak right up and grab one of the people in the back, but that didn't happen. Sometimes they'd get super jumpy and we'd wait for a bit for them to walk ahead. One of these times we were hiding just off the woods, just off the side of the road, and we both saw a dark outline of someone and a dime light about five to 10 feet away. It looked like someone had a small flashlight and was holding their hand over the beam to try and keep hidden. I was mad that someone had broken the no flashlight rule and figured they knew we had been following them and left an uncle behind to catch us. I whispered, don't say anything, we're trying to scare them. And whoever was there whispered back, okay. That was it. They didn't say anything else, just stood there waiting for us in the dark for what must have been 30 seconds to a minute before we took off after them. We never got close enough to scare them and heard them turning back around. So we hid in the woods and stalked them on our way back, scared them right outside the campground. Once everyone got to talking, it turns out that no one had left the group and they had no clue that we were following them. So they wouldn't have left anyone to catch us. My stepson agrees we saw and heard the same thing. We all had the encounter and we were pretty far down the dirt road. I'd definitely say we were at least a mile and a half from the campground and we didn't see anyone else walking. And I don't think we've ever had one on these ghost walks. It's like the 10th year we'd done it. It's stupid dark out there and I can literally think of zero reasons why anyone would be out there hiding off in the road while my family are walking past. And it was chilling when we found out it wasn't a relative and we had just stood there with whoever it was for what felt like a long time. It was a Friday evening, maybe around 6 p.m. I was walking my dog through the woods. I was wearing headphones and I used to walk here all the time on this route, so there's no reason to be afraid. It was very rare to see anyone else walking at this time on a Friday, which is why I had actually chosen to take this time to walk. I'm coming down through this field slash valley when all of a sudden I start to feel on edge. The feeling just keeps getting worse, so I turned off my iPod and took my headphones out. I was half jogging by the time I got to the bottom of the field, my dog had taken off way ahead of me at this point. I squeezed through a hole in the fence and onto the dirt path surrounded by trees and took the usual right and kept checking behind me. Well, here's the horrifying part. I kept turning around to check if anyone is behind me and see a someone or some shadow-like figure, which is more than what this looked like, flick from behind one tree to another I think I audibly yelped at this point, but I kept power walking. I was still fairly close to whoever slash whatever it was, and tiny teenage me knew that I was unlikely to be able to outrun it. I kept walking a few more paces before turning around again. This goddamn thing is now standing right in the center of the path further back near the trees, and it has its arms straight down, but out from its sides. Its hands were fists, and it was standing there, with wide legs. I say thing because it looked like the shadow of a man. 
It looked like it had a cloak and a whitish brimmed hat, but the whole figure was completely opaque. It just looked angry, and it's staring right down the path at me. Needless to say, I sprinted home from there and practically had a panic attack when I made it back. No idea what it was, but I know what I saw. This was in the UK, and the urban legend about that woods, and the crossroad in particular, is that they used to hang people back on the oak tree back when. Whatever the hell it was, it's something I'll never forget. I often go up to Alaska to visit my grandparents and go fly fishing. It has to be my favorite hobby besides music. This one summer when I was about 14, I had an interesting experience. Me and my grandfather are hiking down this trail to our favorite fishing spot. It's about an eight hour walk. We carry in tents, food and fishing gear. When we get about halfway through the walk, we find that in the middle of the trail is what looks like a giant A. Two trees were broken at the stump on either side of the trail and lead against one another at the tips. These were these medium-sized bushy pine trees you see all over mountainsides. So we think nothing of it and pass under it and keep walking until we finally get to our campsite. When we get there, we find more broken trees like the one before, not just haphazardly, but literally in the same way. Both me and my grandfather are as confused as hell about this, but whatever. It's probably just some dumbass that found this place and wanted to scare people. Oh well. People were here messing around, so let's get set up. So we do, and settle in for the night. I'm in my single person tent, and my grandfather is in his a few feet away. I fall asleep pretty quick. Sometime later that night, my grandfather starts shaking me by the shoulder and telling me to wake up. I crawl out of the tent to look around. It was that time of year. That night is just perpetual twilight so we could still see pretty well. And all of a sudden I hear this high pitched scream. Like if you've ever heard a lynx scream, it would have been pretty much dead on that, but it had some weird twinge to it. We both wrote it off as such, but I still thought something was off about it. And we sat there listening. The next morning we got up and started fishing. It was going great. Both me and my grandfather had caught a lot of grayling we had moved down to where our backs were to the berm that was covered in brush. At the top were these good sized rocks. After about 30 minutes, we hear this loud racket coming from camp, like someone was throwing our things around and that same link scream was coming from the direction of our camp. And as soon as that one scream went up, a second one started from behind the berm. We both flip around and start looking at the berm while glancing back to camp, and we start seeing something move just over the other side. This weird looking head kept popping up and down. It was dark gray, shaped like Patrick's star, and we only saw what we thought was the forehead and up. Before we could make it out, this boulder, bigger than me at the time, comes flying over and lands right in front of me and my grandfather. Well, of course, we bolt back up to camp. When we get there, we find that all our gear is trashed. The tent had shreds in it. Our coolers were thrown everywhere and our packs torn open. We heard the dam scream again and started running. We ran and ran and ran until I puked. All the way, we would hear whoops and the screams from far behind us. When we made it back to the A-shaped thing, the trees were snapped in half and thrown to the side. We finally made it back to my grandfather's truck and drove the hell out of there. We're never going back there again. I don't want to know what it was, and frankly, I don't care. I'm just glad I got out of there. When I said I didn't want to go back there, enough time passed. I had spoken about it, and after telling my fiance, I decided to brave it and return. When I showed her where the boulder landed, it was still there. But age puts perspective on things. It was about the size of an adult chest. So of course it was massive to 12 year old me. I also found my old pocket knife around the area of the camp, but no other remains of the camp were present. And luckily, 
No stick structures either. I was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in summer, when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking slash camping or any other experience had gotten themselves into big trouble. It was around 7am when I found the campsite. First thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my own bag down, grabbed my kit and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back and hands and forearms full of what looked like defensive cuts. I patched him up as best I could, gave him water, checked my map and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very nearby, under two miles, and I was able to flag someone down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about a half hour until rescue got there and I led them to the still unidentified individual. He was not very conversive when I helped him out. I was sure he would be dead before we arrived, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way leaving them my number and to call me to let me know what was up with the person we helped out. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. The story was that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but put it almost directly over his tent and not high enough. The night before it happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting up to reach. The dude survived and swore to the hospital that he was moving to the city and would never go into the woods again. When my father was in his 20s, he liked to frequent a remote hiking trail that was about a 30 minute drive from his house. This trail was situated on the outskirts of his town and was a popular beauty spot. Although it was a huge tourist attraction at the weekend, it could be extremely quiet during the week. Now this was in the 1960s when stranger danger wasn't prevalent and he never considered the dangers of being alone in such a remote place. However, this was all about to change in September of 1968, when he took his last ever solo trip to the trail. He had been frequenting it for about three months at this point with little to no incidents. He had done the same routine where he would park up at 5.30 and continue east to take the larger part of the trail which then looped around and brought him back to the car park at 7.30. This was the summer, and evenings were relatively light until about 8 p.m. My father was particularly strict with his timekeeping because there was little light on the trails, plus the change in temperature hugely decreased at dusk. He was always afraid he would lose his footing or be unable to find his way back to the car so he always ensured he came back before dark. This particular evening, he had arrived later at around 6 p.m. and was surprised to see a tired looking camper van already in the parking lot. Normally, you get a couple of cars that he'd become familiar with, but he had never seen this vehicle before. And something about it just gave him the jitters. But he initially put it down as just never seeing it before. He ignored any red flags that popped up, but decided to take a quicker route to ensure he would be back before dark. He consequently decided to take the trail north, which would save him about 30 minutes. Halfway into his hike, he starts to get the sensation he's being followed. He turns back and expects to see another hiker, but the footpath behind him is empty. 
He looks around to see if there are any animals, or a ranger in view, but he can't see anything. Putting it down to paranoia after seeing the van, he continues, but tries to tune into his environment as best he can, listening for any sound or movement. Deeper into the trail, he becomes more and more uncomfortable and realizes that he is totally alone. He hasn't seen another hiker and the feeling of being watched hasn't left him. He knows he has another 30 minutes of walking, so turning back wouldn't make any sense. He continues but quickens his pace and tries to rationalize why he's feeling like this, but it's no good as he still feels like a deer in headlights. As he approaches a bend in the trail, he immediately gets into the fight or flight feeling when he senses he's in immediate danger. He half expects to see someone as he turns the bend, but no one's there. Still absolutely terrified, he decides he needs to hide from whatever or whoever might be out there, so he hides behind some bushes and tries to remain as quiet as possible. A few minutes go by and nothing, not a sound, and he starts to convince himself that it is probably safe to continue. He is about to come out of his hiding spot when he can hear shuffling sounds. It's very light, but coming from the direction he came from. He's hoping that it turns out to be a deer or another forest creature, so that he can laugh about it and that he's been afraid of nothing. But he sees the outline of a person. He can only partially see them due to his obstructed view, but senses this is a man with a very broad frame. He's walking slowly and carefully past the bushes, as if he doesn't want to be seen. My father then comes to the realization that it is probably who had been following him and wants set off his warning messages to hide. He quickly ponders what he needs to do. He can't go back in the opposite direction and it's a good hour of walking and nightfall is approaching. He also doesn't want to continue the remainder of the trail because he may meet whoever was following him. He considers the possibility of hiding for a bit longer, but that would mean being stuck on the trail in the pitch darkness. Then he realizes where he is. He is about a 10 minute run up to the main road that is situated behind the wooded area where he resides. All he has to do is get to the road and it's probably another 10 minutes to his car but it's 10 minutes of being in the open. He may just get away with it. So he waits until he suspects the man is out of view and makes a run for it. Two minutes into his running, he starts to hear the branches snapping to his right. It's the man from before. He's now pursuing him through the trees. My father manages to outrun the man and makes it safely onto the road and pauses for a second to catch his breath and then jogs back to the car park, too afraid to look back. On safe arrival to the car, he notices the camper van is still there, but the other cars have since left, leaving him alone. He quickly gets to his car and drives out as fast as he can. As he's pulling out of the road, he looks towards where he had just come from, and the man is just standing in the road. He's staring wide-eyed at my father, with no expression, no movement, just stood there staring. My father drives in the opposite direction and can see the man just stood in the road still watching his car as he pulls out of view. My father still has no idea if the man actually meant any harm, but it took him a good long time to return to the trails. He would always take a friend and preferred to go at busier times. He did report the incident to the park rangers, but nothing ever really came from it. I have recently ventured up the trails, just with friends to confirm that it's not somewhere you would want to be alone. My wife and I were hiking, a very long way from the trailhead at least seven miles in on a snowy day. We had the whole mountain to ourselves and hadn't seen another person all day and didn't see another track. Near the top of a hill, we walk into a grove of cedars, when this guy comes out of nowhere from behind a tree. 
like super deliberately heads right for us, hand in pockets, breathing heavily, and shifting his eyes from left to right, as if hoping no one else would see what he was about to do. As he comes up to us, he went to pull his hand out of his pocket quickly, and whatever he was pulling got caught. He tried several more times and it wouldn't come out. Then, he started to stand there and make small talk, so we noped out of there. I'm positive he was trying to pull a gun, and feel like we might have been his first failed attempt. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington, near Mount Rainer. Like, not an official campground, just way out in the forest, where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I wake up and hear something, open my tent. There is a guy sitting by where my fire had been right outside it. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude sitting there a couple of feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything, just him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent. His eyes got huge like he'd seen a ghost and he took off. It shook me up pretty bad, but over the next day, I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not too far from mine. Then after that, 15 miles away in a totally random direction that no one could take the same path as by accident. I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises and I got more and more convinced it was a person. I called out to them and out of the darkness someone was like, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? No, I say. I didn't even think it was a real place. They kept talking from just out my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, ain't that away, and kind of spooked, and I didn't want to piss off a potentially crazy person. After 15 minutes of being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer, so I shined my light that way again, and it was the same dude who'd have been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have been following me for at least 15 miles over two days because there's no way he could have just accidentally woken up in the same spot, as vast as that wilderness is. No way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness. So I quickly stopped after 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't have been written off, because the only way he could have been in both places is if he were following me. I decided the trip was over first thing in the morning, and hiked back over three days, consistently doubling back, trying to see if I could throw anyone off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods, and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to potentially avoid being murdered. On the first night of the hike out, twice I heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, no one was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first, but then I slowly decided it sounded more human and that it was trying to imitate animal calls. It could have actually been an animal, but I didn't really see the guy again, but it really sounded like a person making the howling. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were and no way of getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just how terrifying those few days were. This is my father's story. My father used to have a business in maintaining the woods. It's a thing in my country which basically means cutting down dead trees and hauling them out of the area. This meant that he was out in the woods all day, and he was allowed in places normal citizens couldn't go because of rules by the Forestry Commission. My dad was working in the early morning when he suddenly noticed a car in the middle of the woods. It drove through a small path normally only used by the forester. It wasn't a car from the commission, 
So he thought it was very weird that it was there. However, Dad was alone, and it was the 80s, and he didn't have a mobile phone to contact anyone. Since it was in the middle of nowhere, he decided to ignore it. He kept on hauling wood through the woods with his horse, when he suddenly heard men speaking. Now my dad is a brave man and as strong as a bear, so he decided to take a quick peek to see what the hell those folks were doing. My dad looked around some thick bushes to make sure he could see the men. They were digging a hole. My father decided that it was something he really didn't want to interrupt, and he kept working through the day like nothing ever happened. He made sure to keep some distance between him and the digging site. The men apparently never noticed my dad, possibly because his equipment wasn't located in the direction the men came from, and my father worked with horses, so there weren't any loud machines. It was the 80s after all. At the end of the day, my father got to the local commission office and reported it, and they called the police. They went to the spot where the men had been burying something, and they found the body of a young woman. It still irks my dad to this day. He was alone out there. What if the men saw him? What if he decided to check the burial ground out himself? Scary possibilities. I like to hike in really deep woods, finding all railed roads and stuff. Pennsylvania game lands have lots of old, narrow gorge tracks from the logging days. We had some interesting finds. I once found a wreath made of vines and antlers on a tree in SGL 60. I looked out of there real quick. And another time I followed an old road in SGL 158 till it disappeared into the woods. There was abandoned stuff everywhere. Logging equipment, metal barrels, chains, gave me the creeps for some reason, probably because I watched Annihilation the night before. Well, I was on the Appalachian Trail in Maine and got chased by something. It sounds stupid, but I honestly don't know what it was. My brother and I were exploring a trail after setting up camp, and we saw movement about 10 yards away, and something came screaming and screeching out of the underbrush. It was short and brown, but I didn't even get a good look at it. Might have been a chupacabra or a chicken, and I just remember running faster than I'd ever had before, hand on my big knife and unclipping it. Imagine if it were like a grouse and I killed myself tripping and landing on my knife. After a hundred yards, we stopped and wheeled around, knives out and panting hard. It wasn't behind us. Still no idea what it was, but I wasn't a fan. One out of ten would not recommend to friends. I was hiking a section of the North Mkua Trail, the northern part of Southern Oregon, a few years back, with my sister-in-law. It's about a 72 mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Mkua River, and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to take some pictures and have a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like someone was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us across the trail and up a very small incline. Through the trees I could see a small meadow Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old, canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Don't turn around. Don't look behind us. Just continue walking and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody, not right behind us, could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There is a thick moss cover under the trees, 
so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forwards and told her to pick up speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not stop until I told her to. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the damn wind. I just kept telling her to go. I could see ahead of us that the trail made an incline and veered to the right along the river and around the cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down on the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anyone behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we were not halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother, not my ex, to pick us up. So we made our way out to 138 and started walking east towards home, knowing he'd find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story, and explained it might be a day or two before they could get into the trail, as they had a missing hunter at the time they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we were not crazy or imagining things and someone really did chase us. I ask what they found and who it was, and he looks down at the ground and looks up and said, I'm not gonna tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere again. What we found was not normal and will not happen again here. He then instructed me to never ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found out or who it was. I never hiked that section of the trail again and it completely burnt last year. I also never hiked unarmed again. That was huge for me as I was not a gun person. I've had many incidents living up there in a national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing has ever scared me as much as that day. I have an experience to share with you that happened to me and a group of my very close friends. But before I get into it, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. My name is Tom. I weigh about 160 pounds and stand at 5 foot 11. I'm 25 and love the outdoors so much that I actually started a club in high school called the Outdoor Grizzlies. It was a very small group of us who would set up different hiking trips to go on. We had hiked all the way to the beautiful Sleeping Giant State Park trails of Connecticut, all the way to the Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park in California, which has a fantastic 80-foot waterfall with a lavish scenery. In this group of my fellow friends are my best friend from middle school, Jake, my good friend I met in freshman year of high school, Jennifer, and Jake's girlfriend since high school, Christine. The four of us were inseparable, and we went on all of our hiking trips together in high school. We held fundraisers, and the school saw how much we loved nature, and that we could make a career out of it. So they gladly allow us to take a step further, we were all in shape for the most part, which is why we loved doing what we did. Not only did it free our minds and give us clarity, but it took away some of the anxiety that you often experience as a teenager, as well as depression. Anyway, we at least didn't have to go through it very much. As I said, the hiking really helped deal with it. Even our teachers at some point went with us and said that it really helped manage their stress and anxiety too. But after graduating from high school, things sort of died down at the club. We all kept in touch and stuff, as most people in high school do, but life happens. The only one I really spoke to was Jake. He and Christine were still together, but I barely spoke about hiking because it just wasn't in our blood anymore. Jennifer did her own thing, and was seeing a college jock called Robert. And with the exception of Jake, 
we all drifted for a few years. One evening, in May, I decided it would be nice to throw a bonfire with just a few close friends. Christine didn't really want to hang around people she didn't know, and she had the bright idea to invite Jennifer. Through the power of social media, it turns out Jennifer was actually very happy and willing to come. She spoke about how life got in the way of her and Robert, and how they broke up. The bonfire would be just what she needed so that we could all catch up and talk about life, and it would be like old times. She said her number was still the same, and said to call her to confirm. It was easier than I thought. Suddenly I was filled with happiness and excitement. It was going to be just like old times. When the bonfire happened, it went off without a hitch. We had a fantastic time. It was around 1.30 a.m. and everyone else had gone. The ones who were left were myself, Jake, Jennifer and Christine. The cool spring breeze embraced my neck and the fire kissed my nose, leaving me with goosebumps. Jake had mentioned how peaceful and nostalgic this was as he downed the tail end of his beer. The energy in the group was so nice, and Jennifer mentioned how I once slipped on a wet rock trying to run away from an unusual bug, which we all nicknamed the bug incident. We all laughed, and Jake said that if only we could relive those days. Christine looked over at Jennifer and said, maybe we can't go back, but can relive them. Then, a sudden idea crossed everyone's mind. See, we'd always spoken about going somewhere, somewhere exotic, and having a huge hike there. That was our dream years ago. But then, the spark of genius filled us all, and we formed a plan to go to Hawaii. Jake's aunt, fortunate for us, was a flight attendant, and I had a rainy day with a generous amount of money and Jennifer saved money for a trip that she was going to take on her own, and Christine had a decent-sized YouTube following from her makeup channel, and she was sure whatever else she needed she would crowdfund. After three weeks, we pulled our finances, and we were able to afford the trip. We were going to stay around the Honolulu area, because there was a very well-known hiking place with a beautiful waterfall. We arrived to our destination, and decided to be tourists for the first three days, leaving the last three to hike the area, and the seventh day to get ready to leave. We, however, wanted to take it a step further, and wanted to camp out there too. We had done it many times. We were well versed in camping, so we felt like we could take this on no problem. We made our way deeper and deeper into the forest, we saw people along the way, tourists we spoke to, a few friendly locals, and then we began to notice how much more isolated it became. Christine had said that we seemed far away and didn't have any signal on our phones. She bought a compass and a map, so she said we should just find a place around the area that we were in, and we all agreed. We found a beautiful place, almost as if like it were waiting for us. It was on a cliffside looking over almost the entire island. It was at this point we realized just how far we'd hiked, and it was relatively safe. There was a fence made of bamboo, so you couldn't really fall unless you purposefully threw yourself over the fence. But even then, there was a big enough rock protruding out so that you wouldn't fall. It was the most magnificent view I'd ever seen. We set up the tent we had, and some lanterns around a fire to keep away the insects. Jennifer and Christine wanted to explore nearby to see if there was anything here, while Jake and I were setting everything up. When we hear the girls call out, Hey, we found a clearing and some bushes. Oh, and there are stairs. I thought they were joking. When we went over to look, we saw they were pretty worn and they led to a piece of rock on the bottom. To put it into better perspective, if you imagine pride rock from the Lion King, we were standing on the flat piece, 
Then imagine another flat piece on the bottom. But then there are stairs wrapping around to connect the two. Jennifer was against going down the worn steps because she was afraid that someone may get hurt. But we had to know what was down there. And Jake and I said that we would go while the girls stayed from their own choice. They were made of stone and were worn, but when we got to the middle, it wasn't actually that bad. We finally got down and saw that it was a piece of rock which we were standing on, on the upper level. It was like a cave underneath. We made our way in and we could hear the footsteps of crushing broken coconut shells and sand grit as we walked. Jake took his flashlight and lit up the inside. We were amazed. There seemed to be drawings on the walls and what looked like a burial site. It looked disturbed, but the drawings had us intrigued. I lit my flashlight and pointed it to the wall. We were able to make out bodies and very tiny heads. The walls looked untouched. We carefully swept the debris from the wall. We needed more light to understand the carvings and we called the girls to come down, who did so with reluctance. We asked them to light their flashlights and point at the wall. We all did the same, and they were amazed. We took pictures and agreed to inform the information desk of this place when we were leaving. Maybe we had discovered something that had been forgotten to time. Then Christine said that the carvings told a sequence of events from right to left. As we looked, it just looked like a figure being pushed off a ledge. It was at this point that we got chills and decided to head back up. Jake broke the silence and said that, remember, the carvings are probably from thousands of years ago. It was just history. But we agreed that it was still creepy. And that if it were to rain, we would seek refuge in the cave. But that would be a last resort. We opted to go look around not too far from the campsite, but just exploring. We were all inspired since we stumbled across the carvings on the wall. Perhaps we would be fortunate enough to find something else. We were about 15 minutes into the walk when we realized the sun was beginning to set. And Christine said that we should probably head back. That we didn't want to get caught out in the dark as it would obviously make things harder for us while trying to get back to the camp. As we were heading back, we heard rustling and sticks breaking. Christine grabbed Jake and Jennifer locked arms with mine. We thought it was an animal, and braced ourselves in the defensive just in case, when suddenly the large leaves parted, and what appeared to be a native Hawaiian man with a straw hat and a touristy looking shirt emerged from the bushes. He asked why we were here. We explained we were hikers and that we have a campsite not too far from the rock and told him about the strange carvings we saw on the wall. His eyes widened and they felt like they pierced our very souls. He said he would give us a little bit of advice and the advice consisted of pack up and leave. The bad things happen here and that a curse had been placed on the area, and that we should go. We all asked why. The man stared at us before saying, the night marches. He then said that Bo approaches, and to get somewhere safe, and to never look at them in the eye. With that final cryptic message, he went off. We all looked at one another. Jake said, did we really come all this way to leave? We decided it was only going to be one night, and dusk was approaching soon, as the morning comes and we'll just pack and leave. We didn't want to touch anything. So we made our way back to the campsite, and when we finally got back, Jennifer remembered that she bought a pot and two cans of clam chowder with pita bread. We lit the fire and enjoyed a reasonable dinner. It was one of the best nights we had since our high school days. Christine looked at her watch and noticed it was a quarter to 1 a.m. I'll never forget the time because it was the night from hell.
we decided to get ourselves ready to sleep. Two people could fit in one tent, and since it was so beautiful outside, Jennifer and I opted to admire the stars and lay out and fall asleep under them. I remember thinking to myself, I only see skies like this on wallpaper for my computer. It was so magical I dozed off. I remember waking up to use the bathroom. There was really no bathroom, so I decided to go into the woods. It was silent. There were no animals making noises, no insects, nothing. It was eerie quiet. It was as if time had stopped. I quietly walked behind the tent into some bushes to release, when suddenly I heard a horn. I'm not sure what it was, but it sounded like a horn. I just passed it off as me hallucinating and headed back to sleep. Suddenly, as I was drifting off, I heard what sounded like a drum. My finger tapped the ground to the beat of the drum as it began to get louder. Jake awoke and peeked outside the tent and looked at me. How do you have service, man? Turn it down. I told Jake it wasn't me. Now, if you knew Jake, he could be very serious and would only call me by my full name in these situations. Thomas, stop joking around and go to bed, yeah? You know we gotta get up early. He rubbed his eyes looking at his Apple Watch. Suddenly a horn noise went off again, this time louder. Jennifer sat up. Suddenly, the drum was even closer. Christine was still fast asleep. That's when it dawned on us that the sounds were coming from all around us and we felt cornered as they got closer. We were frozen and we made a plan to leave. Jake went back into the tent and you could hear him whisper to Christine. I was trying to gather our things and I motioned to Jennifer to grab her bag, but she was just staring behind me. I had a sickening feeling in the pit of my stomach. I turned around to look while I could hear Jake gathering his things in the tent. My fight or flight kicked in as my head slowly turned. That is when I saw a man standing at at least six foot tall with a machete. But that wasn't the frightening part. It was his head. It was very small. He had what appeared to be a coconut for a head. Or at least it was covering what was his head and it was no bigger than a coconut. We were all frozen in fear. I immediately pushed Jennifer away from looking at the monster, and she snapped out of it, grabbed me, and we ran, with Jake and Christine following. We had no idea in which direction we were going, we simply ran. We left all our possessions and heard footsteps and branches breaking, like there were at least ten or more of them chasing after us. I don't know how we got through the forest. Christine noticed a strong river of water and figured that we could lose them if we crossed. We all jumped and began making our way through, but it kept getting deeper, and before we knew it, the river had overpowered us and carried us away. We looked back and saw five of them at the riverbank with various weapons in their hand. They were no longer following us, simply staring. That moment will be etched into my head for as long as I live. The look of them at the riverbank as we were slowly departing. I don't think I'll ever forget the beings with average height but small heads. And I ended up passing out. I woke up with the sun in my face and Christine hitting me. She had a gash on her head and Jake and the rest of us were covered in scratches and bruises. Before we could even talk, we heard a helicopter over our heads. They airlifted us to the island nursing triage to get checked out. I asked them how they found us. Apparently an Apple Watch ping sent the coordinates at 4.55 and they'd been searching for us for four hours. Christine just cried and Jennifer hugged her. Jake and I looked at one another. The guy added that we should never have been there anyway. The local authorities came to speak with us and asked what happened, and we told them about the drawings and the men with the small heads. They went on to explain it was just folklore, 
that people get so frightened with the night marchers that they end their lives because their minds can't take what they see. They had only two instances of documented suicides, one from a 19-year-old girl who jumped off the rock cliff that we were camping at, and the other person they called off the search for because authorities refused to search when night approaches. The area was closed off to the public when they found four headless bodies in the 1980s, and perpetrators were never found. He continued that we must have been way off the trail to be at that rocky area because it's completely closed off. They seemed puzzled with how we even got there to begin with. I had chills running down my spine. What the hell did we see? Was it even a head at all? How could they have breathed or seen anything with the coconut covering them? I asked if the night marchers have heads. He said, since we're alive to tell the tale, they didn't remove their coconut shell. But had we died and jumped off the cliff like the young girl, we would have apparently known the answer. After this, we decided to take a very long break from hiking or camping and just met up at a bar. The four of us don't really talk about this anymore. I'm sure it's to no one's surprise. It almost ended our friendship. But I'm glad now that after four years, we can sort of move past it. What you're about to hear is the most traumatic experience of my life. It was New Year's Eve, and me and my girlfriend Jane were getting ready to go see some fireworks. Jane and I knew a great spot deep in the woods where we could see the fireworks and left at about 9.30, as the show was starting at 10. We made sure to pack some food, water, flashlights, and even a compass in case we got lost. We parked our car on the side of the road and made our way to the spot, I would say about a 15 minute walk or so until we reached it, which was a huge clearing surrounded by woods on all sides. Jane and I sat down and started watching the fireworks show. About 15 minutes into the show, Jane looks at the woods and says, did you see that? I was confused and looked in the direction of the woods Jane was talking about, but saw nothing. I told her it was probably just a deer and we continued watching the fireworks show. Five minutes passed by, and I had completely forgotten about the incident, until Jane tells me to shush. I'm confused and ask why, and she says, Do you hear that? I listen closely, and can hear leaves crunching and twigs snapping. I look in the direction of the sound, and can somewhat make out the figure of a man. At first I didn't believe it, but then a bright firework lit up the night sky along with the woods, and I can now clearly see a man about six foot three walking towards us. I'm about six five, and probably could have taken on this man if he wanted trouble. But everything changed when another firework revealed a large knife in his hand. I told Jane to run, and we both dart back into the woods in the direction of our car. All the while, this man is running about 20 feet behind us. After two or three minutes of running, we managed to lose the guy. But when we arrive at my car, I made a horrifying discovery. All four of my tires had been slashed. We didn't know what to do. My car's tires were slashed, and there was a maniac trying to kill us. And all in the while, Jane was going crazy. I tried calling 911, but just my luck, I had no service. Fortunately, we saw a truck coming down the road, and Jane quickly flagged down the driver. It parked behind us, and a large dude stepped out. We quickly explained what was going on, and he went back to his truck and pulled out a gun along with a satellite phone, which we used to call the police, and they said they'd be there in minutes. While we were waiting, Jane investigated the woods and screamed. I quickly looked over in the direction she was looking in and I see the man walking towards us. Jane yells that it's him. The driver of the truck takes one good look at him and fires a warning shot. The gunshot sends him running back into the woods and after three minutes of waiting in fear, the cops arrive. They call in a team to check the woods, along with a AAA truck to fix my car. The rest of the night was me and Jane at the police station, and we tried to give our best description, but it was so dark we could barely make out his face. This had to have been the worst New Year's of my life, 
I don't know what would have happened if Jane hadn't have spotted him. We haven't ever been to that spot since. As you can imagine, it's not on our agenda. The following story stands out as the most unnerving thing I've ever experienced. It's one thing to see a sign warning about a predator in an area. It's another thing to be stalked by it all day. I went out one afternoon on my small John boat to do some fishing in the swamp, mainly for warmouth. I was pretty familiar with the area and motored out three to four miles to reach my favorite spot. Alligators are fairly commonplace out there and it's just something you become accustomed to. Generally, if you respect them, they'll respect you as they become pretty used to fishermen. The water in the swamp are full of tannic acid from the decaying leaves at the bottom. So the water looks inky black at first and visibility is only a few inches. Anything that is visible just under the surface is tinted a dark amber color. I had caught a few fish and noticed that around 50 to 60 yards back up the canal, a pair of eyes floating just above the water were pointing in my direction. It was a gator, no big deal. They've learned to be opportunistic and steal stringers of fish if you leave them hanging over the side of the boat. I continued fishing for a few minutes. I had just reached down over the side of the boat to grab the lip of a warm mouth I'd hooked. As I pulled the fish out, I saw the faintest glint of amber in the water about a foot below where my hand had just been. I watched as the faint glint slowly rose up towards the surface of the water, revealing two black eyes and the largest jaw on any gator I've seen in the wild. I slid back to the center of my small john boat as the head of the gator broke the surface. I could feel it sliding back along the bottom of my boat, shifting it slightly. And after watching it for 10 to 15 seconds, it finally swam out from under the boat. I'm guessing it was pushing 12 to 13 feet. And that's after having seen hundreds of gators. This gator followed me for the rest of the day. I'd motor ahead a ways just to put some distance between us. And not long after I'd stop, I'd feel the familiar bump on the bottom of the boat each time. It would eventually swim off and then turn back and stare at me. I've never felt more outmatched. This dark, quiet, toothy thing had the ability to sneak up on you at any time it pleased and get within three feet of you before you even knew it was there. Do you know how unnerving it is to look something in the eye that makes it abundantly clear that it's only waiting for you to make a mistake. There's a level of intelligence and focus in those eyes that makes you understand your place in the food chain. It's not the first time gators have followed me. I've been followed by three at once before, but none have ever made me so intimately aware that the only thing on its mind was to drag me out my boat and under the surface of that black water. Of the countless hours I've spent in the wood, this is the only time, the only few seconds, I can't explain. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under our canopy of stars more nights than I can count. And I've trekked thousands of miles of trails, riverbanks, lake shores, ridges, bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand I've heard, seen, and smell about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring. So the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour past that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. 
The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by a thick underbrush. Young maple, an old oak growth, and I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I hear a crack, and I froze solid. In this part, I have trouble describing 4.30 in springtime. It means I'm the only thing making noise. There's no birds chirping, nothing. It's dead quiet. I froze mid-step. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinctual thoughts. The first thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there balancing myself in silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and I'm going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant I gotta get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a smallish tree. More a fungo bat sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack and not a thud or thump. I have described it as explosive in the past because it was so sudden and terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there completely spooked, I realized the soon to be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come to an 180 degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant as soon as I got the courage to move towards the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head somewhere between meth fiend murder and Bigfoot bludgeoning. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. There's nothing. Dead quiet and I've got about 20 to 30 minutes into a first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep to the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail and it didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. And then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. And this was like days old decomposition, but it smelled strange. I kept walking fast. By the time I made it to the top of the ridge, I was huffing and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I've heard it in all our woods. I've smelled it all. And I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall and especially leafed out branches make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many times. I don't know. I am a local to the South Jersey area, Pine Barrens and all. I hunt and fish on the regular, and my house is in the woods. I'm used to the sounds and things that regularly happen around New Jersey. I've had two experiences that I could never grasp an explanation for that still give me chills. The first one? It was a cold six day firearm season, and it was opening day. I had set my stand up in a new spot a little bit further than my previous year. I'm following my bright eyes, reflectors, to get to my stand and it's pitch black and cold. I'm saying minus four with the wind. Not common in New Jersey, so it's already eerie as I'm walking through the pines and I get about 25 yards from my tree when I stop to light a cigarette before I go up. 
As I'm standing there a mile deep in the pine barrens alone in the dark, I hear a grunt. Not a deer grunt, a full-blown snarl. It stops and goes on for a minute or two. At this point, my shotgun is stacked to the rim and I'm looking towards the noise. It charges me, gets about 10 yards out, and I shot once, hitting to the left of it. This sent it off into the darkness. So I figured, get in your tree now. So I booked it. I was about 10 yards away from my tree, and I get charged again, this time from the back, thrusting me to the ground. I went face down in delusion. Whatever it was had hit me and kept going. I stayed in my tree until 10 a.m. when it was bright out. My only description of the thing would be a hog mixed with a goat. It was terrifying. And by the way, we don't have any wild boar here. Now for the second story. I fish the Great Egg Harbor River regularly, especially striper fishing, which just so happens to land in the fall, which is cold. I walk a trail that used to go to an old shipbuilder's manufacturer on the river. I fish the old structure. Bass love the structure. However, there is still a remaining building that's standing. Not bad until you go in. So one day, me and a friend of mine are going to catch the outgoing tide. We load the truck, drove to the trail and hiked about a mile. We get down and set up. The conditions are perfect. However, about an hour in, the rain came. And when it comes, we knew it was gonna pour. So we packed our stuff and headed for the building. Once inside, we set our stuff down and figured, screw it, let's just chill for a bit and explore the rooms. Bad idea. It gets creepy in the storm. So we walk up to the second floor where there was a line of rooms on the right and a balcony on the left overlooking the building. As we approached the first door, my friend regretted it. He didn't want to go in anymore and immediately turned around with a big note. I like exploring, so I kept on going. I checked the first room to find nothing spectacular and kept walking, checking the rooms one by one. Then I get to the second to last one and I got this weird sensation in my body, almost like I'd received the worst news of my life. I broke down. Once I got it together, I boogied downstairs where I found that my friend had left and already headed for the truck, leaving all of his fishing equipment. So I grabbed everything and ran out, but I had to run back to grab my rod holder that I was using as a bum defense. As I looked at the second story window, I saw a child standing there. It was the scariest moment of my life and I will never go fishing there again. Me and a group of 20 others were hiking in a two-person side-to-side line through thick woods at around 1 a.m. We managed to find a muddy road which we continued to walk over for miles before going back into the woods. While walking on the muddy road, I held a conversation with one of my friends that was to the right of me. After a while of talking, I noticed that my group was further ahead of me than before, so I picked up the pace. As I got closer, I noticed something odd. The friend I was talking to was already with the rest of my group. I asked him, how did he get back so quick? And he turned and looked at me and said, I was wondering where you were, you disappeared for a good five minutes. Let's just say I didn't feel right after hearing those words. I know for a fact I was speaking to him earlier, and if not him, then someone exactly with all the same gear. Luckily, nothing happened after that, but I was pretty shook for the rest of the hiking night. This all happened in Poland when I was a teenager as part of what I call a survivalist camp. This happened when I was 10. There were five or six of us spending the night at my friend Charlie's house. Her parents owned a ranch in the hill country region of Texas, and their home was built on top of a hill. Other than the dirt driveway up to their house, the hill was wild land covered in cedar trees. It was a clear, slightly chilly night in October or November. It's been a few years since I was 10, so bear with me. But after the sun went down, the moon was out. So we stayed out playing hide and seek using the driveway as a base. 
their ranch, was far enough out the way and well fenced so her parents didn't have a problem with it. Anyway, during one round of hide and seek, me and my friend Gina were the last two hidden. We were so good at avoiding being found that the seeker found everyone else, or so we thought, and enlisted their help to find us. We had made it back down the road when three of us girls unknowingly cut us off and we ducked down behind a large ridge of dirt and remained concealed. Gina chucked a rock across the road behind them to divert their attention. We were waiting for them to get far enough off the road to make a dramatic rush for the safety of base when I heard what sounded like a rock getting dislodged and sliding down the hill behind us. I thought Gina might have done it, so I didn't say anything but she kind of looked at me and asked if I was okay. I was about to reply when we heard what sounded like one of my friends, Charlie, the one whose house we were staying at, calling from way down the hill behind us. Help me. We bolted straight up and yelled for the others. They came running to the road and we told them what we heard. No one had seen Charlie since we had started that round of hide and seek. We took them to this spot where we then hid from them and called out Charlie's name. For a moment all was quiet, then faintly even further down the hill we heard her say, Help, I'm stuck. We panicked and ran up the driveway as fast as we could to get Charlie's parents. When we burst through the kitchen door ready to yell for her mum and dad, Charlie was sitting at the bar eating a popsicle. I wondered how long it was going to take for you to find me, she gloated. We all flipped out in the way that only ten-year-old girls can. Her parents heard us freaking out and decided to come down and see what was going on. We told them what happened and her dad grabbed his shotgun and got in the truck and he went to drive around the ranch making sure there wasn't anyone on the property who wasn't supposed to be there, but he didn't find anything. I've always wondered what we heard that night. We didn't talk about it much, but I know it remained in all our minds every time we stayed over there past sundown. Does anyone know what it may have been? Especially since other people seem to have heard little girls' voices outdoors. Explanations welcome. A few months ago, my friend and I went to hike Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs. The hike up this mountain is literally marathon with about 7,000 feet of vertical gain. And the general rule of thumb is that if you're not up and back down below the tree line by noon, then you are at risk of being struck by lightning. So we made the decision to hike the whole thing in one day by starting at 11 p.m. the night before. So we had rolled up to the trailhead at 10.30, only to find the parking lot completely empty, which felt very odd for a 14er trailhead on a Friday night in late summer. I had done nighttime hikes of other mountains, but the parking lot was usually at least half full at all times, especially in the late summer in Colorado. That made me feel a little uneasy, but I shrugged it off and we started the hike. We started off at a pretty good pace, getting about five miles in within the first few hours, and it was about 1am at this point. We're walking along a narrow part of the trail that has a large rock cropping out to the right of us. As we pass it, we hear a scraping noise followed by some rustling of bushes and then silence. That freaked me out a bit, but I told myself it was a deer and that we must have spooked him, and we continued along. For the next few miles, I kept hearing little noises off in the distance to our right. About an hour later at 2 a.m., we had just passed Bar Camp, which is about seven miles from the trailhead, still without seeing any other human being other than my friend. Even the campsite was deserted. Anyway, I'm walking along the trail about two to three meters ahead of my friend when I look up a little and see two glowing white circles floating in the darkness on the trail about 15 meters ahead of me. My heart sunk and I stopped dead in my tracks. My friend asked me why I'd stopped and I told him to point his headlamp, which was brighter than mine up the trail. We saw that the two glowing orbs belonged to a mountain lion. At this point, I was just frozen looking at him thinking, crap, that is the last thing I want to see out here. He was quite aware of our presence as well, 
and stared at us for about 15 seconds and then retreated into the darkness behind some trees. At this point, without saying a word, I take out a thing of bear mace and hand it to my friend and we turn around on the spot and begin hiking back down the mountain at a very brisk pace. I was looking right down the trail and my friend spent about 80% of the time walking back to back with me so that it wouldn't jump scare us. We made it back down the trailhead at about 3.30, counted our blessings and went home. Overall, the hike was a very unsettling experience. Being deep in the forest without coming across any other people, especially when you would expect to meet others, is uncomfortable, let alone being stalked by one of the most dangerous predators in North America. I know that most of the time mountain lions don't attack humans, but I've been told that if you see a mountain lion, then they've been aware of your presence for a good while prior to that. And if they make their presence known to you, it's usually a warning. So I can only assume that all noises I heard that night were from the mountain lion stalking us. Also, the next day we found out why we were alone on the trail. Earlier that day, an elderly man had had a heart attack and died on the trail. So the trail was closed, but we missed the memo since we got up there so late. I am a wildlife biologist and one of my duties is monitoring owls in the middle of the night. To do this, you have to walk along trails in the dead of night. Sometimes I'm out until two to three a.m. bear in mind and stop periodically to play owl calls and listen for them to respond. Usually, this is done with a partner, but I work for a chronically underfunded state agency, so I do the surveys alone. I do my surveys in redwood forests pretty far from civilization, so the forest is silent and pitch black. Sometimes the trees creak and moan, which is scary as hell, but honestly, the scariest part of my job is humans. Lots of creepy stuff happens when I do our surveys, but the creepiest I'm about to share. I was hiking down a defunct branch of a well-used trail at around midnight. The trail was cut into a steep slope and there was a wide river on the other side of the trail that followed for about a mile until it joined with the main trail. It was about three stations into my survey and I stopped for my next station. The owl calls are on a pre-recorded tape, played fairly loud. And at one point there's an ear splitting shriek and I always plug my ears for that part. So I plug my ears and when I remove my hands, I hear the tail end of a scream on the other side of the river. Not an owl, not a rabbit, not a fox. Nothing I've ever heard before. I literally stopped breathing and after that scream, a man shouts. Kind of a moaning shout, maybe in pain. I wasn't sure. Maybe this was the wrong thing to do, but I packed up my wildlife caller and ran the hell out of there, never finished the survey and reported it to USFWS as survey interrupted by human activity and next time just called that area from my truck on the main trail with the volume cranked up. We used to catch fish in my grandparents' cabin near the Canadian border and we would have a dumping ground for the guts of the fish we caught. This was probably 250 yards into the woods, far away from the cabin so we wouldn't attract bears or other scavengers near our place where we were staying. I was 11 years old and was tasked with dumping the guts. It was dusk and I headed into the woods when I took a wrong turn and realized this and headed back to the main trail when all of a sudden it was getting dark. I didn't have a flashlight or phone on me, so I kept walking down the trail and I find the dumping ground. So here I am, it's almost pitch black except for the moon and I smell rotting fish guts when I hear a large animal probably 20 feet away from me in the woods. I slowly walk down the trail and when I get on the main road, I book it back to my cabin. The next day, we find cougar tracks at the fish dumping ground. To this day, I'm terrified of the woods at night. 
It was a seriously traumatic experience. This was when I was 13. I made this discovery with my cousin. We would often venture back behind my house into the woods. I knew my way around it, my neighbors knew their way around it, and so forth. There were little foot trails worked into the ground from both active deer running through and us walking there every other day. We normally would only go and relax by a special tree next to a nice little stream we found, but ended up walking a bit further along the deer path. I remember it being a few months since the last time I'd been back there, but along this path I'd walked dozens of times before, I saw a red and white beer cooler, like the ones you'd take camping off to the side. Now I knew this was a very rural community, pretty much everyone hunted deer and or owned guns. I decided to check this cooler around, being a cautious teen, and I kid you not, it was full of blood. Not just like all dumped in there, but dozens of Ziploc bags of blood. It scared the bloody hell out of me and we left immediately. Being young, I was scared and didn't tell adults, as I wrote it off as being deer blood. I went back a few months after with a different cousin of mine, as my family hosted lots of summer camping slash grills, and the cooler was still in the exact same way I left it, opened and showing all of its contents. It reeked to ungodly levels at this point, as you might imagine, being in mid-Michigan summer heat constantly. I don't know why, but my young brain thought it would be a good idea to dump it all out and stab the bags open, as I carried a little life with me to make me look cool. I haven't been back since, but have the feeling the cooler will still be there. I don't think that there were any missing people ever reported in my hometown, and I sometimes think back about it, and I just wonder, who the hell put that cooler there? I was with my older brother, spotting deer a couple of miles from our house. My brother had just started driving a few weeks ago, so we decided to take out my mum's car for a spin. We were on a very narrow and windy dirt road with no street lights at all. We didn't see any deer, so we were about to leave the area. I heard some twigs or something snapping in the brush, and it sounded no more than a few yards away. Me and my brother both shined our spotlights towards the sound, hoping we would see a deer or turkey, but we saw something that will probably never leave our minds until the day we die. There were over a dozen people standing right in front of us looking at us. We were so scared we just zoomed out of there. We didn't really tell anyone because we were pretty much on private property, but it was terrifying. Just the way all those people were in the woods, standing in the dark with blank faces. It was really creepy. We never went anywhere near that road again. I used to work security, and several years ago, I was assigned to a remote construction site where a summer camp was being built. It was quite literally in the middle of the woods, roughly four or five miles into the forest, with only a single access road they'd been using to haul equipment and supplies and such. My job was to provide overnight security doing a foot patrol of the entire area. The patrol covered two miles in all, roughly once every hour, and then go back to my post, a tiny wooden shack, not much bigger than a phone booth to fill up my logs. Other than the occasional black bear and coyotes, it was a very boring assignment with one exception. I was doing a routine patrol one night near the end of my shift at around 3 a.m. or so. I just passed the gate where the access road enters the site when I heard an extremely loud and piercing scream that seemed to have come from some distance down the road. It sounded like a woman screaming in absolute terror, so I immediately took off sprinting as fast as I could in that direction. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, but about a quarter of a mile or so down the road, I came upon a car parked off just the side. There was no car in sight when I'd come through my way to make my shift, so it must have parked there fairly recently. It wasn't running, no lights were turned on, nor were any doors open. I called out to see if anyone was there to receive no answer, and looked around the general area, 
but didn't see a thing. Needless to say, I was pretty goddamn sketched out at this point. I ran back to my post and reported what I'd seen and heard to the police since there really wasn't anything else I could do. Unfortunately, nothing ever really came of it. I never found out whose scream I heard or what caused it. The car was apparently owned by a guy who lived in the area, but I never heard why he was there. My supervisor suggested that maybe I'd heard a mountain lion or other animals screaming, but I've heard these sounds before. And although they're freaky, there's no mistaking an honest to goodness human scream. Me and my sister would take long trips into deep woods surrounding our secluded home. At a certain spot in the journey, a German shepherd without a collar would run out of nowhere and greet us. He was a fully grown dog and very friendly. He would follow us around for a bit and then continue on his way. Well, one day we went out like any other day, except our friend wasn't showing up. We didn't think too much of it until we found his body. It looked like he had been attacked by wolves with how ripped apart he was, but it didn't look like the animal ate very much of my doggy friend at all, just sort of tore him up and left. Later, we kept walking and talking about it until I hear a weird sound come from the distance. It sounded like what I can only describe as maybe a large animal moaning with a sense of pain or confusion. It was far at first, but when we heard it, we stopped to listen. We couldn't hear leaves moving, but I heard it again, this time noticeably closer. The sound of a wailing animal, but it seemed more aggressive sounding this time. Then we hear it again, but it's directly on the other side of the hill that we're at. It was bone chilling, almost like a dying woman. Me and my sister bolted out of there without even thinking about each other, just sprinting all the way back to the trail that would take us home. Sometimes I wish I had stayed to see what it was, but I'm good with the outcome of living. I was around 19 and had gone camping with two of my buddies in central Oregon very remote type of place, taking hours of driving just to get to the trailhead. It was a three-day backpacking excursion, or at least that is what we had intended. We were young and inexperienced and wound up getting lost on the second day. It took us four days to find our way out of the dense growth. Incidentally, we stumbled into a deserted mining town by accident, which gave us our bearings. We rationed our provisions, so we were far from a dire predicament in this regard and it was mid-August, so the elements did not impact us too adversely. So far, nothing creepy about it, but when that happened in the fourth night of our trip, it's something that will not escape me soon. By this point, we were growing pretty concerned at our situation, as the entire day had been spent trying to find our way out of the woods. We had settled into a camp for the night, wary and anxious. Our fire was dying out, so we threw in a few more hunks of wood and climbed into our tents in the hopes of catching some much needed sleep. I can't be sure who woke up first, but it was either me or one of my friends. I can't describe exactly what woke us, but what we heard next was something that sounded like a telegraph or perhaps an old typewriter. It was faint, but with an unmistakably clear cadence of seemingly random clicks and taps. I poked my head out of the booth to find both of my friends wide-eyed, staring. We were definitely all hearing it, but no one said a word. The fire was smoldering and ashing, and the sky was overcast so we couldn't see beyond our tents. The sound was faint and hard to pinpoint, but in my mind, I kept trying to rationalize the sound being a squirrel or a woodpecker. Before any of us had a chance to say anything, a new sound could be heard. It was distinctly more faint, but undeniably not an unnatural sound that you would hear in the middle of the woods dozens of miles away from the nearest town. When we heard it, the noise that sounded like the transmission you hear between NASA flight control and astronauts in outer space, overlaid with music that sounded like orchestra, a high-pitched beeping sound, music, static, silence, unintelligible words being spoken by a male voice, more static, high-pitched beeps, silence, music, static, 
The beep had a resonating echo. The static would go on for a minute at a time, broken by bouts of short silence. We were lost in it. The air was a thick damp, and I could feel the gravelly sound scraping against my senses. I recall my hand was trembling when I looked down. The whole ordeal lasted maybe half hour, but in a court of law I'd swear it was hours. None of us rest the rest of the night. We wandered aimlessly around the next day, tired and dazzled, growing increasingly terrified of the darkness that approached. Neither of us spoke of the incident after the trip. We never made any pact or anything corny, we just ignored it. And um, before anyone asks, we weren't high or tripping anything. We hadn't even packed any alcohol. We were completely sober. I'm 28 now and have lost touch with my two buddies from that trip. Though I thought I found one of them was a KIA in Iraq last year. I still have dreams about that night because they aren't necessarily as horrifying as they are incredibly rare. We were out with a few friends a few miles from Pikes Peak in Colorado. We're hiking on this trail and up ahead I see a blue windbreaker in the middle of the trail. We hadn't seen anyone else out walking all day as it's pretty remote where we're staying. So it was weird for it to be placed right in the middle of the path. But hey, things happen and people drop things, so maybe it fell out of a backpack and no one noticed. The windbreaker was just a piece of this entire campsite we ended up coming across that was absolutely torn to shreds. There was a tent, a hammock, a cooler, a backpack, various articles of clothing thrown around as well. The tent had broken poles, was shredded, and looked like it was from the early 2000s, and the fading that was apparent with the old style of it. Think of a four-person basic tent from Walmart, not a nice, fancy, lightweight backpacking thing. The hammock was still hanging, empty. The cooler was open and empty. A few shirts and shorts were scattered, and the backpack was empty. We told ourselves it must be some homeless shelter, and that was a good enough excuse for us to leave everything how it was and continue back to the cabin that we were staying at. This happened last year. I'm a guy in my early 20s and there's a park close to the place I live. You follow this road that goes down to the small river the road begins in a fairly populated area. And as you go down the river maybe 200 meters, you get to the park near the small river. The park doesn't have any lights, and even though it's surrounded by many residential buildings, it's still isolated with the trees all around like a smaller forest. There's a specific area that I go to when I chill out for a bit. It's at the end of a park, and there's a stone I like to sit on. To get to this area, you have to walk across an open grassy field, and I come here when I want to chill out by myself, have peace of mind, and escape from the everyday madness that life can sometimes be. It was around 10 p.m. and I grab my bike and start riding towards that place. It takes no more than three to five minutes to get there on a bike, even though it's night and the park is pitch black. I still wanted to go and smoke a cigarette or two near the river in the beautiful nature. So I get there, park my bike next to it and light up a sick pull out my phone and watch something on YouTube while enjoying the calmness around me of the sound of flowing water. I spent half hour looking at my phone when I caught a glimpse of something in the dark. I'm getting chills as I remember this. At first I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. It was pitch black after all. And after a few seconds I realized something is actually definitely there, 10 to 15 meters away from me. I got up to get a better look and notice that the dark silhouette is slowly approaching, as if to not make a sound, and then it suddenly dropped to the ground. As I saw the movement on the ground, I thought it must be an animal, a raccoon perhaps. Why the hell would a person slowly move towards me and then drop to the ground when I noticed it, right? I turned on the lights on my bicycle and pointed it towards the dark figure. It was not an animal. It was a Middle Eastern man ducking down and staring at me. Now keep in mind I'm at the dead end of a park and no roads lead to here, so you have to get through an open field to arrive. The light of my phone was definitely visible to him. Hi, I say as soon as the light revealed him. I did this kind of automatically. 
I guess I was looking for a reaction. I did that just to bust him trying to sneak up on me. Turn it off, he says. Why? Turn it off. I'm just gonna leave, I say as I'm getting on my bike, still carefully watching for his movement. As I'm driving away, I'm still looking at him closely. He got up and made a few steps towards the place I was sitting at, then ducked down again. I got far enough away to feel safe and instantly wondered what would have happened if I'd have kept my eyes on the phone for another minute. Guess I won't be chilling at that place anymore, at least not at night. What were his intentions? He definitely was trying to stay quiet in the dark. This is a good reminder that sickos do exist. Be careful out in the woods, everyone. I was in the mountains of North Carolina for several days. It was beautiful and peaceful hiking with my brother and sister and their friend Caleb. Until one early morning at around 3 a.m. when every creature in a 10 mile radius was chirping, squeaking, howling, or scampering through the woods. Being from the Midwest and having survived two tornadoes, I thought the worst weather event of my life was about to occur, and there I was, sleeping in a hammock. For those of you who don't know, just before a tornado is formed above your head, every animal in sight will be out of there. They know, they can feel it. You can feel it too. You just won't know what you're feeling until the 60-year-old tree besides you is being ripped from the ground. Being in the eye of the tornado is even more strange, as all those same animals are frozen. Sure, they still exist, but their little soul is on hold, and they don't do much more than just look around quietly. It's quite creepy. Anyway, this wasn't a tornado. 3 a.m., the fire we made was just embers, and a roaring thunder of animals freaking out. I peek my head out of the hammock, imagining getting my face smashed in by the first softball-sized hail. With my luck, just for looking. But no, there was no bad weather. There was no storm or looming catastrophe. It was a beautiful night, aside from the roaring animal kingdom. My brother peeked his head out of the hammock above me and looked down to see if I was awake. When he saw my eyes as wide as saucers, he whispered, what the hell's happening? I replied, I don't know, but I wish I was up there in your hammock. Being on the ground level usually is best for guys my size, around 235 pounds. I lack the grace to climb up hammock ropes and jump into bed eight feet off the ground. The terrifying creepy roaring continued for about 30 seconds, and then it suddenly stopped. It seemed to be a sweeping effect there was the outside of the radius, and it stopped first, and the creatures closer to us stopped last, but it was only a second or two difference. It was pretty damn synchronized. My brother and I freaked out. After five minutes of silence, we got out of the hammocks and started the fire again. This time, we made sure it was big enough to light up a hundred feet out. The last thing we need is a Bigfoot or some weird stuff going down. My brother went to check up the ridge, on my sister and Caleb, about 60 feet uphill from our hammocks. Caleb always wanted to be at the highest possible safe spot so he could watch the sunrise from his hammock. As soon as my brother got their hammocks, he yelled a shrieking kind of yell for me, the kind I had only heard twice before, when his friend got his bike handle lodged in his stomach about an inch deep, and when he split his own head open. I ran up the ridge with an axe in my hand, with first aid on my left and flashlight in my teeth, expecting the worst. When I arrived to Caleb's bottom bunk, he was in a state of shock, eyes wide open, shivering and shaking as he was staring down the valley. Wouldn't you know, my sister didn't even wake up. She had her headphones in all light listening to folk music. Apparently she hates the sounds of animals and preferred to have a controlled mental state. We woke her up and she had no idea what was going on. We eventually got Caleb down to the fire and wrapped him in some blankets. I gave him a shot of whiskey to sip on, but he mostly just held it and stared into the fire. The whole night was too weird for sleep. 
But then Caleb finally lay down next to the fire and fell asleep at around 5 a.m. The sun came up and my siblings and I decided to leave the fire and go see the sunrise from the ridge. We all sat in Caleb's hammock, still bewildered. The sun was perfect and Caleb picked out the best spot you could imagine. But then my brother spotted something strange. What's that? He said, pointing down the valley, right there on the bank of the river. My sister and I were struggling to get his perspective, but then finally noticed a clearing. We decided to go check it out, but one of us had to stay with Caleb, and my sister volunteered, as she hates creepy things. She didn't want us to go down, but we insisted. I left her my axe and emergency GPS signal device and told her to just scream if she needs us and to not hesitate to use her pepper spray. So my brother and I hiked down to the river. It took about 20 minutes, but when we arrived, we felt very uncomfortable. There were no animals around, no birds, no squirrels, nothing. The clearing on the riverbank was around 100 yards upstream. We took to the higher side of the bank to keep our distance. I don't think either of us actually expected anything to go down, but we wanted to remain cautious. When we were around 50 yards away, at a slight elevation to the clearing, we pulled out our phones to take pictures, but our phones were dead. Mine is known to die, but I have an external battery pack that attaches to my Otterbox that I know was fully charged. My brother's phone was always reliable, and usually he had his portable solar charger attached, but that was dead too. Both of us tried to hold our power buttons to no avail. It was about 100 feet across the clearing and in the shape of a triangle. All of the bushes and plants that typically grew alongside the river were flattened down. Even some mature azalea bushes that typically stand at six to eight feet tall were eerily lying flat. It's as if something in a triangle shape had bent down as close to the ground as it could get, but nothing appeared broken, but rather as if it had grown along the earth instead of growing up towards the sun. When we got back to camp, Caleb was awake. My sister had a weird look on her face. Caleb was totally normal. Hey bro, you all right? My brother asked. Yeah man, doing fine. Missed the sunrise, I guess. I needed the sleep. We looked at him concerned. He was eating a breakfast bar and heating up coffee. We sat down across from him and I asked, so uh, do you remember that stuff from last night? He looked puzzled. My brother added, you know when all the animals freaked out and we found you. He looked so confused. My sister said, Caleb, stop playing. But he asked what we were talking about. My brother said that he was so messed up last night and Caleb laughed and responded, yeah, I figured I had to be, because I'd never slept next to the fire all wrapped up in blankets, not after getting that bug in my ear that one time. We continued to probe him, but he had no memory whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he had too many drinks and slept next to the fire. We told him our story and each of us agreed, but he had no recollection. We told him about the spot next to the river and how our phones wouldn't turn on. We pulled our phones out to show him and they were already on. My brother had 67% and I had 41. That gave us the creeps real quick. We decided to pack up camp and get the hell away from that spot. But before we did a final sweep, Caleb asked if we'd seen his camera. He had a nice DSLR Sony with a very good lens, but it was gone. The weirdest part is that he slept with it in his hammock every single time he went camping and we'd never seen it not on his body. He even had specifically remembered taking it to bed and tucking it in his bag and putting the lens in its special sleeve. It's like a ritual for him. He takes very good care of his stuff. We searched around the ridge, all around the fire and in between the two spots. It was nowhere to be found. Caleb even went down the ridge a bit towards the river in case it had fallen out and rolled down the hill, but it was gone. We had to leave and my siblings and I agreed to pitch in to buy him a new one if he would just get out of there. About three miles and an hour later, my brother turned to me on the trail and said, do you think he tried to take a picture of something he wasn't supposed to see? And the creepiest feeling swept over me and I replied, 
Bro, let's just forget how messed up that was and get the hell away from here. And he nodded in agreement. It's been a few years now, and they haven't seen or heard from Caleb in at least eight months. No one has. This happened to some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia, when we wanted to go underage drinking. We would go buy a case of beer or bottle of spirits and hike about four kilometers into the bush to the middle of nowhere to drink without worrying about getting into trouble. We would sleep in a sleeping bag under the stars in summer and be fine. So one afternoon, my friends without me this time head off with beer to the usual camp spot we'd use. Being young and stupid, no one checked the weather forecast, otherwise they would have known the heavy rain was on the way. In the middle of the night, five drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. The caves sit high up, overlooking a large fork in the Hawkesbury River. Soaked from the rain and cold, they start to dig a fire pit. Unfortunately, they dig up human remains and were too drunk to return home so spent a miserable night in the rain waiting for dawn, didn't dare stay anywhere near the caves. The police investigated and discovered the remains were in a very old Aboriginal burial site and were relocated to avoid being accidentally disturbed again. I grew up in a really rural town. It took 15 minutes of driving to get to any sort of establishment. One night when I was around eight or nine, my friend and I were standing outside in the driveway, waiting for my father to come outside to bring her home. All of a sudden, we hear this rustling around the bushes. Now, it would be strange for a deer to come that close to a few kids fooling around, but we couldn't see what it was, and our first reaction was to figure it must be an animal. It was just an animal until we hear a deep, rough voice go, Hey. We ran into the house, screaming, and as we got to the door, there was something in our bushes. My father came to investigate and I was still shaking in my boots. When a drunk man comes wandering out of the bushes, he said he heard us talking so he thought we could help him, but I'm still confused as to how we managed to get into the bushes in the first place. I was looking at the road that was about half a mile long and we sent him on his way. And from then on, it was easy to make me jump out of fright when I was alone in the driveway at night. I had a bad experience in Montana on some medication that affected my oxygen intake and decided to go back on my own, which entailed sleeping by myself a few nights, which at 10,000 feet can be a little frightening in itself. On the last day hiking, I was exhausted. I wouldn't have even been able to fend off an aggressive six-year-old. I then came across a freshly killed elk, literally lying on the trail. This was a very large animal, and two Europeans came across the scene exactly at the same time and just lost their minds and took off running. I was barely able to walk and just hoped whatever killed the animal would leave me alone. I did make it back okay. Just this last October, I was in Dolly Sods in West Virginia and somehow ended up getting turned around. I've been on at least 16 backpacking trips out west at much higher altitudes and have never gotten lost. It was long day, around 15 miles with a full pack. And to this day, I have no idea how I ended up getting turned around. It was like an episode of the Twilight Zone and I started having thoughts that wasn't in my reality anymore and that I would walk this trail for eternity. My brother and friend went out looking for me, which felt terrible. I met a couple who had also been lost, but figured out where they were and I followed them out. I literally ended up going in the opposite direction and to this day have no idea how I could have been that clueless. It was a big deal and sent me into a deep depression. I'm fine now, but feel that something strange certainly happened in those mountains. Sometimes I see weird things when I walk my dogs. This time I took them to some little forest that's not too far from home. Usually this forest is very quiet and there aren't many people around, which is why I enjoy going. On this particular day, my dog started to bark at something. 
I didn't pay too much attention to it until they ran towards the thing they were barking at. I ran after them in case it was a person or some animal that was causing them so much distress, but they suddenly stopped at some huge bushes and the barking ceased. The first thing I noticed was this bad smell of something rotten and the presence of a lot of flies nearby. I wanted to investigate, so I took a look around the big bush and what I found wasn't what I expected. I thought it would be a dead animal, but instead I found this huge bundle. It looked more like a sack and it was tied up with a very large rope. At that time, I didn't think too much of it. I thought it was some cow that died and its lazy owner left the body there inside the sack. But why would someone do that? It really didn't make sense at all. I moved it with some large stick and that caused a cacophony of flies to come emerging from it. But that smell, the awful rotting smell stuck in my nose. The barking began again, but I didn't find anything so I carried on. I returned a week later. I tried to stay away, but my curiosity got the better of me and I went back to investigate. This time there were more flies than the last and someone moved it not too far from the bush trying to dig a hole where it was originally. The sack was covering up some dirt. I didn't notice anything else, but it was strange. Why would someone move it? I leaned down and saw the sack was broken and I could see what's inside. It looked like a head but had no skin. It was brown with no hair. I panicked because I realized that the thing inside was no farm animal. It looked like a human in the fetal position. I took my dogs and ran home as fast as I could. I wanted to call the cops, but when I got there, my family wanted to be sure and we returned there. But strangely enough, by the time we arrived, the sack was gone and half the hole under the bush was filled with dirt again. I think someone was watching me and saw me snooping around. We didn't end up calling the police. Why would they believe me? There was no evidence. It was very creepy though. I was hiking through the remnants of a remote, long abandoned town and the surrounding area. To get to as far into the woods as I was, you had to cross fallen trees over a creek three times. I had just crossed the third bridge and was about five miles in when something blue caught my eye ahead of me. There was a man in his sixties at least, wearing blue satin pajamas sitting in a tree. The closer I got to him, the louder he laughed. It wasn't maniacal, but it set off all the alarms in my head nevertheless. He also wasn't wearing any shoes and looked very well groomed and cleaned. I gave him a friendly nod and he just kept laughing. Then it stopped. I turned around and he was gone. There was no branch cracking, plants rustling, nothing. He was just gone. It still rubs me the wrong way. The area I was in was pretty rough to hike, very secluded. Not very many people would venture as deep as I did that day. And I seriously wonder what was going on. I was hiking across Newfoundland following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned trailers falling apart, bus conversions burnt out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy, but interesting at the same time. The sun was warning. So I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot then had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine near it. I kicked up some food and crawled into my tent to sleep. I woke up sometime in the night and heard footsteps outside it. At first, I think it's an animal, but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The steps get closer and go around my tent. I slowly and quietly pull out my knife if he tries to get in, and my plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my tent at night in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. 
My heart is racing at this point, but I just try to be quiet. Luckily, the steps start moving back from the tent until I can't hear them anymore. I wait a bit to see if they'll come back, but I don't hear anything. I slowly get out of my tent, don't see anything, and without turning my flashlight on, I quickly take everything and stuff it into my bag. After that, I start walking down the trail and get the hell out of there. I walked until daylight, came across a road and flagged down a truck. The guy was nice and drove me to town where I got a hotel. The creepy thing was, when I think back to it, whoever that was was likely watching me walk into town from one of the abandoned structures. I'm guessing a squatter. I'd like to think he was just curious, but I'm glad I didn't stay and wait to see if he'd be back. My friends and I used to hike a lot near my place. I live in a nice, quiet, well it was quiet then, neighborhood very close to a mountain. Over time we started exploring and eventually made our own path by clearing away plants and stuff. The path was kind of hidden. You had to go out of the trail, which wasn't frequented a lot. One day we were almost at the top of the mountain, which is a four hour hike, falling around and I took out my camera and started recording a video of my friend doing a stupid dance. We hiked uphill for another hour until we got to the end of the trail we made and then went back down. We walked to my place and split. When I downloaded the photos and video to my computer, I noticed the unmistakable shape of a man crossing the trail about 20 meters from us. This is a hidden trail we made ourselves and it takes four hours to get there. I'm pretty sure we were followed and I still don't understand how we didn't notice. From that day on, we always took one of our friends, huge St. Bernard's with us when we went hiking. Some other weird stuff happened there. We would hear strange noises, sounds like, ooh, and at certain times of the day, it happened. We also found a grave. The name was Margarito Esperanza. Again, this was in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't even a trail there before we made one. We also found a creepy cave with a wooden door and iron fitting. The door looked hundreds of years old. The tiny cave was empty, but I never had the balls to go in there without a flashlight. I wish I'd have taken a picture of it. Unfortunately, that part of the mountain is now inaccessible due to urban development that happened in 2006 and 7. I live near Lake of the Woods in northwestern Ontario. This one time, a friend and I were mountain biking on a hot day in August when we ended up on a trail in the bush where there is an abandoned car graveyard. Nothing too scary, it's pretty normal for people to scrap their cars out in the bush here, so we carry on. Buddy and I are excited to explore the area because there is a lot of interesting vehicles and parts to build jumps with. We end up sticking for about an hour or two until dusk, just starting to set in when we come across a black 1950s Buick Roadmaster that looked like it got halfway through restoration. That's when we realized that something was sort of off about this place. There were no properties near this spot for miles, and it was very strange that someone would abandon such a beautiful car halfway through repair. My alarm bells were ringing, but only a little, so we carried on, and we were pretty beat from all the riding that we were doing that day, and decided to find a place to rest, and walked a little more into the trail towards a small dirt pile when we immediately realized that something was definitely wrong. The place was littered with animal bones from different animals. There were deer skulls, rabbits, dogs, and what looked like feline bones. I'm starting to feel a little sick to my stomach, but my buddy seems unfazed by it. I can't tell if he's the braver of the two of us or less intelligent at this point because I keep telling him with increasing urgency that we need to get on our bikes and get the hell out of here. He tells me I shouldn't worry and tries to rationalize it by saying that it was some hunters illegally dumping here despite the canine bones. He walked to the other side of the dirt pile, turned around, ghost white and said, we need to get out of here now. I managed to peek around and caught a glimpse of what was on the other side. Holy Jesus, someone built a shrine here. I'm screaming inside of my head to leave, and I scramble to grab my bike and my backpack. As we're about to pedal off, we hear someone shouting, 
Hey, to the right of us in the thick. I've never bolted so damn fast out of somewhere in my entire life. I try to get a glimpse behind me. There's an old man in a plaid shirt with blue jean overalls at near the dirt pile with a shovel in his hand, shouting at us and gesturing for us to come back. When we thought we got close enough to the main road, we decided to take a break and catch our breath. My friend and I are soaked with sweat, chugging our water and completely unsure of what we just saw. We sat on the road for about five minutes, relieved that nothing became of it, and talked about what it might have been. My friend and I still trying to rationalize it when suddenly we hear a loud vroom and my heart skipped a beat. He started the car and we peeled down the main road to his house in what felt like two minutes, which should have been at least a 10 minute ride. I could feel the lactic acid building up in my legs from pedaling so hard, gears maxed out even uphill. This was 12 years ago. I still don't know what was happening down that trail, but I'm glad I never stayed to find out. About three years ago, I was walking up a trail with my wife, who was kind of sensitive to the paranormal. She was the first to get a weird feeling about the part of the woods we wandered in. And it took me a bit longer before the gut feeling kicked in. We decided to ignore it and push forwards, thinking there was probably an animal nearby, and we're just freaking ourselves out. We get another 100 yards or so down the trail, and I feel this burning on my back, and we decide to go back home. We get home, and I take my shorts off to find three long claw marks going down my back. She sages me and sprinkles this oil stuff on me and the scratches go away. About this time last year, I was hiking up a trail through some old native land, known to have burial mounds visible from the trail. I get walking a good ways down the trail to catch something out of the corner of my eye, standing on top of one of the grave mounds, but it's gone when I turn to look. For another half mile or so, I feel there's something watching me, and I swear I've been hearing soft whistles coming from the woods all around the trail, so I decide to whistle back. No sooner than I finish my whistle, a rock comes flying past my head, bouncing off a tree beside me, and I've stopped going into the woods since then. This story takes place about four years ago. It was my wife, my dog, and myself. We were on the second day of an 80 kilometer hike in Northern Ontario. We set up camp on a point 750 meters into a lake, one way onto the point and one way off the point. We were hearing wolves since about 9 p.m., went to bed by 10, and the house were getting closer and closer. Then one howled from right behind us on the trail down to the point. I got out of the tent and started making loads of noise in an attempt to scare it off. This usually works for bears, whom we've had loads of encounters with. I didn't see anything there and didn't hear anything either. I went back to bed and laid down, trying to act confident as to not upset my wife. That's when we both heard something outside of the tent. My dog was crazy quiet and shaking. I opened the tent to find a wolf staring at me from about 15 feet away. I grabbed the bear spray and took aim. I didn't use it, but I again started screaming at the wolf and took a few charges towards it. Again, this usually works when faced with a black bear if you have no escape. The wolf didn't really care that I was yelling at it. It kind of hung out for a few seconds, then kind of very casually walked into the tree line, just far enough that I couldn't see it anymore. I built a fire between the tent and the bush and sat up all night, kept my headlamp on all night and had to listen to three or four wolves howl to each other all night about every 20 minutes. They were very close. I would estimate them to be within 50 yards. I'm sure they were here to come and grab my dog. And at about 6 a.m. a bunch of them started howling together, way more than during the night. We waited until about 8 a.m packed all our stuff and got out of there. We were 36 kilometers and it took us two days to hike in. We hiked out in 6.5 hours. About 1.5 hours into our hike, the wolves started howling behind us again. They were following us. 
On the hike out, we saw a bear with two cubs. This would usually concern us a bit, but we just wanted to get the hell out of there. My wife lost all her toenails from the hike, and my poor dog got some serious anxiety about being in a tent. This happened about two years ago. The anniversary of it is actually coming up because it happened on my friend's birthday. The day started off with the four of us hanging out, James, Brian, and Timmy. It was James's birthday. We all four had hung out at the local park at the large river next to it and a local hiking trail that ran alongside it. The hiking trail had a long history of being an old train railroad and all kinds of things. At around 9 p.m., Brian and Timmy decided it was time to go home and left me and James at the park. Me and James's idea was to camp out in the woods that was next to the park for the night, since we had a secret camp spot there. I say secret loosely, since all the neighborhood teens also camped out there and partied. Me and James began to set up camp there and attempted to start a fire. But since it had been raining the past few days, the wood was way too wet for it to start. At the time, James got a call from Brian. He answered it, and at first he had a weird look on his face. He then took the phone from his face and put the phone on speaker. Can you both hear me? Brian said. We both said yes. We could also hear Timmy in the background. All right, well, me and Timmy just saw something really weird. We asked him what he saw. He looked like a person running on all fours. I sat there puzzled and asked what was so weird about it. Because it was running across the river by you guys' campsite. We quickly packed up and left the campsite. Surely we thought maybe they were joking, but both Brian and Timmy have never been known to lie. We decided to walk around the town for a few hours until we somehow ended up walking on the hiking trail that ran by the river. It was around 3 a.m. now, and we were starting to come up to a tight bend on the trail to where you couldn't see that well in front of you. It already being night, and the trail being littered with trees on both sides, as we were turning the bend, we both heard a very odd noise. I'm still not exactly sure how to describe it. It's almost like you would describe a young lady crying, but throw in a wicked laugh in there as well. I don't even know if that does it justice, but as we fully came through the bend, the path turned slightly, and we both stopped in our tracks, standing about 50 feet in front of us, seeing what could only be described as an elongated grey humanoid thing on all fours, slightly crawling towards us. It had no hair anywhere on its body. We both quickly turned back around, and I have never run so fast in my life. We didn't say a single word. We just ran the two miles back to my house. We rarely talk about it anymore, only that neither of us can describe the sound we heard that night or what we saw. Keep in mind my friend is a hard skeptic in anything paranormal or supernatural related. I live out in a rural area. My bedroom has one of those sliding glass doors that's just a big sheet of glass with a frame. One night a few months back, I'm chilling in my room around midnight when I notice something outside through the corner of my eye. Now I see plenty of wildlife around the place, raccoons, foxes, squirrels, deer, skunks, and more. I'd seen a fox outside my door not long before, so I figured it was a fox again. I saw the tip of a tail and started thinking of the fox. When I followed the body, it was too large to be a fox. Then I followed it to the head, and the head turned to look at me, and Christ, it was a mountain lion. I had to hold in the urge to piss myself and just turned and walked the hell off. I didn't want to deal with that. I went hiking around the Lake District in England in 2018 with my dad. It's a generally hilly area and rural and very beautiful. We stayed in a B&B for the week and for a few of these days it was raining very heavily as it was February. My dad's been trying to complete his bucket list for the last few years, and hiking in heavy rain was on it because it reminded him of Brazil from when he lived there. We had a bunch of gear and walked around. 
The plan was to start small in the Lake District and then eventually work our way up to Mount Snowdon in Wales. During our second day of hiking, the ground was very slodgy. We sat down on a steep hill 20 feet above the ground level and watched the sunset. Then the ground started moving beneath us. It was a landslide and our weight on top of it had pretty much done it. I slid down 15 feet of mud, sprained my ankle badly and my dad reached out to grab me and slid down with me. I had managed to dig my feet into the mud and stopped myself. I was pretty much at the bottom by the time I stopped and the ground was very much level there. I was covered in about a foot and a half of dirt and was muddy from head to toe. It took about 20 minutes to get me out safely and we had the air ambulance come and grab me because I was afraid I'd broken my leg. That was the closest near-death experience I've come to and the scariest moment I've ever had while hiking out in the woods. I spent a week with a Schur family in the Amazon, about 15 miles from Chone, Ecuador. Little background. Three of us gringo medical slash pre-medical students were staying with them on a medical educational rotation, learning about traditional remedies. It was a blast. We stayed in a separate shelter from the family and the walls of our shelter were decorated with giant snake skins and tigre skins. Those beasts had to have wandered too close to camp over the years. The jungle is a loud place to sleep. Millions of animals and insects clamor all night long and it blends into a sort of peaceful cacophony after a gunshot ran out at 3 a.m. The cacophony was gone. Absolute silence reigned. It was the scariest sound I've ever heard. We clung to my two-inch knife, telling ourselves it would protect us from whatever was coming. We cowered across the entrance to our shelter, awaiting what was to come, certain a tiger was lurking, or that our lovely hosts had decided they were sick of us, and we sat and shivered through the night. The silence was terrifying. When the sun rose, we finally felt confident enough to venture outside. It turned out an unlucky capybara wandered through camp during the night. Poor little bugger got shot in the face at 3 a.m. And it was the first meat we'd eaten all week by 7 a.m. Tasted like greasy venison. I'll never forget that night or the lovely family. I am a hunter slash mountaineer. It was a chilly December morning. I hiked in pre-dawn, talking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trails. I got to my nest about a half hour before sunrise and began to settle in. The wind kicked up and a fog rolled in that was thicker than milk. Within a few minutes, my visibility was five inches. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind when I start to hear twigs snapping near me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound, indicative of an immediate successful hunt, sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around into my lever action 3030 as quietly as I could and lay flat on my back, tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peak over the mountains to my east and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or beside me. I remember laying there, rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it was to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, and I had likely stumbled into a herd of whitetail that had bedded down. So I decided to sit up, and the rustling stopped immediately. As it was fully dawn by now, I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally all around me. It wasn't. Seemingly nothing was. By now the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all day, without seeing as much as a squirrel. Around three afternoon after fighting the wind, and an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I have ever felt. 
Lawfully, once you make it back to the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle. Not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop, then listen, and never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could always feel the eyes on me. I was about a hundred feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner, and I saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I'm a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me something fierce. This happened to one of my friends. He and two of his buddies decided to go camping one weekend in the Uinta Mountains in Utah. They wanted to go out in the middle of nowhere to really get away from civilization and just chill and fish and stuff like that. All three of them are pretty outdoorsy and experienced with camping and backpacking, so this was no big deal for them. They went to a trailhead in the Uintas, hiked about half a mile up the trail and then turned off the trail and just hiked for four miles away. They had little trail markers so that they wouldn't be lost coming back, and they found a spot and there was no sign of anyone around. The ground looked untouched by humans and there was also a brook nearby so they decided to set up camp. All three of them had camping hammocks, so they set those up in the trees and then just kind of explored around for a bit before they decided to build a fire and eat. Eventually, the evening rolled around, so they built a fire and made tin foil dinners and were just chatting. When they decided to go to bed, the guy who told me this said he remembered laying in his sleeping bag in his hammock thinking that even though there was the sound of water in the brook nearby, they couldn't hear any sounds like insect noises or whatever. The woods were eerily quiet. Like being out of civilization made him realize how rarely we as humans experience real silence, since we all fill our days with so many noises and distractions. It felt eerie. He could feel himself start to doze off when the worst thing in the world happened to him. He had to pee, when he was already comfortable and warm. He figured he'd rip the band-aid off and go pee before he fell asleep for the night. He put on his headlamp, got out of his hammock and walked about 30 feet away from his buddies in their hammocks to pee. When he was walking over, he thought he saw something dart out of sight unnaturally fast and heard a crack of a branch. But because they were so far out in the wilderness near a brook, he didn't think too much of it. He unzipped his pants, peed, and then right when he was zipping his pants back up, his headlamp shone on something on the ground that paralyzed him with fear. A few feet away, where he had just been peeing, there was the unmistakable mark of fresh human footprints on the ground. It had rained in the mountains the day before, so the earth was soft in some areas, and there was no doubt in his mind that these were not only human footprints, but that whoever had made them was barefoot. The creepiest thing was that the footprints weren't staggered. They were side by side, facing where the guys were camping. It was as though someone was just standing still at the edge of their campsite, in total darkness watching them. Those were the only footprints my friend could see. No other prints leading to or away from them. He totally freaked out ran back to his hammock and got his knife that he always takes camping. He loudly whispered to his two friends, but they were already asleep, so they didn't answer. He debated whether he should wake them up, but decided against it because there was no real physical threat he could think of that would justify waking them up. He put his headlamp on a brighter setting and shone it up in the trees and around the general area of where he peed. Nothing. He didn't sleep that night. He laid in his hammock wide awake with his knife in his hand the entire night. The footprints looked as though someone had been standing there moments before he walked up to the spot to pee, and he felt like he and his friends were not alone. When it reached early in the morning, when the sun just barely started to rise, my friend decided he was gonna pack his stuff up because he was still spooked and wanted to start hiking back to their car when his friends were up. 
When he was taking down the hammock, he saw another set of fresh footprints. At this time, they were ten feet away, like on the edge of the trees behind his hammock. As if someone had been standing about ten feet away from it, just staring at him. Again, no footprints leading to these two other footprints. He was full on freaked out at this point, so he woke up his friend and showed them the footprints, and they got the hell out of there. Sometimes, you're not as alone as you think you are. I was helping run a 99 planter in Trinity County near the Pines, and my girlfriend came out to visit. We had a day off and decided to hike down a well-known ATV trail. Well, we mess up at some point and literally end up walking into the barrel of an AK-47. The dude was just there, all of a sudden in the bush. He knew we were coming. He was a tiny little dude and spoke no English. He was as scared as we were and was yelling instructions in Spanish, which I barely spoke. But luckily, my girl, having grown up in East LA, did speak some. She calmed him down and explained that we had a spot over at the next hill and that we were just hiking. He calmed down and actually ended up walking back with us to the main trail where we parted. He was all business the whole time, never smiled or laughed about the mix up or took his guard down. We likely had stumbled on an illegal ass cartel group, as there are tons out there, and were lucky as hell that he didn't just try to end and bury us there and then. I remember this like it was yesterday, because for me, it was. July 22nd, 2011, I had just gotten married to my beautiful wife at the beginning of the month. I was 34 years old. Have you ever written your thoughts down knowing you're legally dead? Neither have I until now. Like I said, it was July 2011. I'd only been married a few weeks, and one day while my wife took a nap, I decided to take a walk. Right across from my house, across the street, is nothing but woods. According to Google Earth, the woods can go on for a while. I may have been walking between 30 to 45 minutes when I heard a noise. I'm not the kind of guy who believes in ghosts nor Bigfoot, and I'm not worried about other people because I always carry something with me to protect me, and I'm not easily scared. The noise I heard wasn't like a twig snapping, leaves crunching or a rock falling, it was more of a splash. It was more of a splash. So I followed the sound and it led me to a small clearing. I saw a creek, but the water wasn't clear like you normally see. Instead, it was a light greenish color. It had a glow when fog rose from it. It was like nothing I had ever seen before in person, only in horror or sci-fi movies. As I looked at the creek and all of its weird wonders, I heard the splash again. I followed the sound with my eyes and saw a downed tree and saw part of a person's left hand. I immediately ran over and dropped to my knees to help this guy. What I saw next still sticks with me to this day. As the guy raised his head in what I thought was to take a breath, he cut his eyes at me. Halfway still in the water, a smile formed on his face. Just as fast as I saw him, he was gone. He vanished into thin air. Gone. No trace of him at all. Then in what I'm guessing was an hour, I woke up. And I know what you're thinking, it was all just a dream. But wait, I was still in the same spot. I fell asleep in the same spot this guy was in. I jumped up, still feeling a bit dazed, and headed home. A million things were running through my mind, knowing my wife was not going to believe what just happened to me. I just knew I was going to be in trouble. I finally make it home and try to open the door, but my key wouldn't work. Okay, that's weird, I thought. Suddenly, a guy opens the door and asks, Can I help you? Keep in mind, I've never seen this guy before. I ask him who he was, why he was in my house, and where my wife was. Looking confused, he answers, Son, we've lived in this house for eight years. Even more confused, I asked, What do you mean? My wife and I bought this house earlier this month. After this time, a woman walks up to him, and I can only assume it's his wife, and whispers something in his ear about the same time a cop was pulling into the driveway, and I'm guessing that's what she was telling him. 
that she had called the police. They took my wallet, knife, gun and placed it all on the hood of the squad car. The police questioned me and the other guy separately, comparing our stories in just as much confusion as we had. The other guy gave the police all the proper paperwork to prove his side and was released to go back into his home. All of the attention was then turned back to me. I told them I wasn't crazy. I just looked in my wallet and told them to look in my ID and took the serial number on my gun and that I wouldn't lie. They opened my wallet and laid everything out. There was nothing but old newspaper clippings about nothing in particular and there was no ID there. The serial number on the gun came back clean. It was not stolen, but there was also no name of the owner found either. Frustrated, I told them it's been a long day. Can you drive me to my father-in-law's house so he can clear this up? The police officers looked at each other, then back at me and said, sure. 15 minutes later, we pull into my father-in-law's driveway. A smile came across my face and I breathed a sigh of relief, like a brick was taken off my chest. Everything was as I explained it to the officers and soon everything was gonna be okay. One of the officers knocked on my father-in-law's door to talk to him and the other officer and I waited outside. A few minutes later, the officer and my father-in-law walked outside to join us. My father-in-law looked at me with a tear in his eye and said, Sir, this officer told me everything that's going on. I can't imagine what you're going through and I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't know you or how you know these things about me or what kind of sick game this is, but I need you to leave. My heart sank. What in the world was going on? The officers apologized, thanked him for his time and we left. I asked where we were going and they replied to the station to figure this out. I begged them for one last try and asked to call my dad. If anyone could make sense of this, it was gonna be him. I gave him my dad's info, his name and number the whole nine yards. They pulled over and called him and told him everything and you could hear my dad yelling. He definitely wasn't happy and he too thought this was nothing but a sick joke. He screamed he had no idea who this guy was or how he knew me and that the only son he ever had, his ex-wife miscarried 30 years ago and that he suffers with that loss daily and that it was sick and twisted for us to be calling him. There were a few choice words screamed as well as he hung up. So I sit here in this mental hospital, whatever you call it, nothing more than a John Doe. I'm not writing this thinking anyone will believe me because no one else has. I'm sharing this in the hopes that someone will hear this and can help me and will know who I am. The following happened in the lower mainland area of British Columbia. The area is pretty densely forested, with the exception of some walking trails. They're fairly popular, but not popular enough that someone else would be there at the same time as you. There's no cell phone service either. Anyway, an old boyfriend and I were the only ones there this day, and we had made it probably five minutes down the trail when we heard this obnoxiously loud echoing mechanical noise in the distance. It's usually very quiet out there with the exception of the birds and the wind, so we stopped immediately to listen. It got louder and closer really fast. It's so difficult to describe what the noise was like. Extremely loud, loud like a loudspeaker. It sounded like it was trying to mimic the sound of a bird squawking or some Jurassic Park dinosaur but it was too robotic and mechanical sounding to be anything living. Then, this glowing red thing shot out of the top of the trees, and by this time the sound was deafening. The color reminded me of a glowing red stoplight. It was about the size of a hand, but kind of triangle shaped. No wings or any other markings or feature. It was darting back and forth from the treetops, landing on the branch tips, then flying across to the other trees, with such speed and precision that I couldn't keep my eyes off it. Then it started dive bombing my face, coming so close it almost hit me, then flying back up to the top of the trees. Before long, there were more of them. They started getting closer, nearly touching me. My hair was literally being whipped around by how fast they were. My boyfriend had to run back down the trail and had apparently been screaming at me to run the entire time but I hadn't noticed. 
After about 30 seconds of the attack, they all flew straight up into the sky and away into the trees. I could hear them in the distance for a bit. Then they were gone. We waited there for hours, phones out, ready to record for their return. They never did. I returned a handful of times then, waiting in the same spot, but they've never come back. Does anyone have any idea on what this could have been? This happened five or six years ago. I had just moved to Arizona from California to live with my sister after a divorce. Within a year, I landed a job at a grocery store, brought a car from my sister, and was finally getting my life back on track. I've never had friends, not for a lack of trying, and that was also something that never changed. I have that wild and free nature, so I grew up enjoying taking overnight trips on my own. Once in a while I'd get a hotel room, but usually I'd sleep in my car or at a truck stop or a campground to save money and enjoy the thrill of danger and freedom. I'm a five foot two female with no muscle and was in my early twenties during the time that this story took place. I decided I needed to have some form of protection on me during my lone trips, so shelled out 600 bucks on a 9mm revolver. I really hoped that I'd never need to use it, and that I was just wasting my money. One day I decided to try out a campground called Burrow Creek Campground. I arrived after it had gotten dark, paid for two nights and found a nice spot to sleep in my car. When morning came, I realized just how empty the place was. I was one of maybe two or three people that were staying there, and I was the only female. I grabbed my backpack, put my revolver into it, and walked until I found the trail leading to the creek. My first surprise was walking around a bush, only to find myself face to face with a burrow. Behind him stood a big cow that I did not want to get too close to. I slowly walked away from them, careful not to startle them. That's when I saw the creek. It was green, foul, and full of bugs. Disappointing, but I expected as much after reading the reviews online. I continued onwards, swinging my backpack around to unzip it so that I could quickly grab my gun if I ran into any danger. I was there for adventure, and wasn't going to let a cow or foul creek stop me from continuing on. Ahead I spotted some trees. As I walked closer, I could hear a voice behind them. I stopped heart racing, but I figured if someone was talking then it must be two or more people just enjoying a hike. Nothing to fear, right? I brushed it off and carried on. Within a minute a man emerged from behind the trees, alone catching me off guard. I can't quite remember what the man looked like, other than he was middle aged and white. He walked right up to me and said, it's not often you see pretty girls out here alone. I let out a nervous laugh unsure how to react. He asked if I was here with my boyfriend and I said yes. Yes, he's a... Uh... Then I looked up to the mountain where the main road was and pointed. He went up for some groceries, he'll be back at any moment. I'm sure he knew I was lying. I am an awful liar. And then he asked if we were staying at the campground, grinning big, as he had been during the whole encounter up until this point. Like an idiot, I say yes. And suddenly his grin turned upside down. He was suddenly very angry, and marched past me without a word. To defuse the situation and hide my fear, I turned around, waved and told him to have a nice day, but he said nothing, and carried on marching away angrily. That's when I found a bush, and ducked down behind it, pulling my gun out to have it ready should I need it. I was shaking. What was the strange man going to do? Why did it make him so angry that I was staying in the campground with my pretend boyfriend? After all, he wasn't angry about the pretend boyfriend, only that we were staying there. I had to get back to my car, but the only way back was in the same direction that he was traveling and I had no choice. I kept my gun in my hand as I walked along the creek. There were a few trees, so it was best to walk if I didn't want to be seen in that area. Plus, there was no way he'd be crossing that nasty creek and there wasn't anything on the other side except the mountain. That meant I only had to watch him on my left side, and I didn't see him again. Once back to my campsite, I sat on the picnic table and decided what to do. I paid for two nights after all, 
and I had only stayed for one. As I was pondering this, a much older man walked by with his dog. He was chatting with me as he was heading down to the creek in nothing but his swimming trunks. Instead of using the trail that was further down, he went through my campsite to go down a steep, rocky ledge. He was talking about how he can't go get down there and swim the creek. Yes, the green, foul, bug infested one. It was at that moment that I knew I needed to leave. I hurriedly got into my car and loped out of there. All I could think of was, if only I had been dressed like a man, maybe the men wouldn't have bothered me, and I'd been able to enjoy my second night. About a year later, I went to my local Great Clips and asked them to cut my long, thick, beautiful hair down to a short mohawk with the side shaved. Since then, I've kept it short, wear a backwards baseball cap and a men's shirt, and I've been mistaken for a guy on numerous occasions. Being called Sir or freaking women out as I enter the female bathrooms, only for them to realize I am indeed a woman. Men don't bother me anymore. If any of you have any ideas of why that strange man became angry, I'd love to hear your thoughts. It continues to baffle me to this day. I'm hoping someone can help me understand what it was I saw. I live in upstate New York in a relatively high traffic hiking trail that runs alongside a stream for a portion. Last week, I noticed a dead deer near the stream, pretty common in our area, specifically in winter, and went for a walk yesterday evening. I passed where the deer was and saw something that had been really messing with me since. Something was crouched over the dead deer. It looked like a pig, but large, the size of a grown man with loose sagging skin. The whole face was kind of sagging and leaking out of its nose and eyes. I've worked with livestock before, so I know what pigs look like. And this pig was all the wrong shape. Its body was swollen, its back legs were splayed out, and I could see they were really long. It had virtually no hair, just smooth skin. And it was sitting on its back haunches near the deer. And by the time I got close enough to see it, it was staring at me still. I have this sick certainty that it noticed me before I noticed it. I was standing about 20 feet away, still basically on the trail, and it was just staring at me. The deer carcass was kind of everywhere, as it had been messily eaten, and while I was watching the pig, it raised both its front legs and saw that they ended not in cleft feet, but in large hands like humans. It reached into the deer, ripped off a chunk of its side, raised it to its snout, and ate out of its hand. All of this went down in a matter of seconds. As soon as I saw it had hands, I just turned back the way I came and walked as fast as I could out of there. I wanted to run, but I was afraid it would chase me, so I went back the way I came in, just trying to stay calm. It was the worst walk of my life. I was too afraid to look behind me because I was scared I would see the pig thing following me but I made it out and ran across the parking lot to my car. Now I'm just trying to understand this encounter. I want to believe my mind was playing tricks on me. I haven't found anything on the internet about this creature, and if anyone has ever seen anything like this, please tell me. I need to know what I saw that night. My maternal grandmother and great aunt lived in this area called Soso, Mississippi near Rose Hill. One day they had forgotten to get water for the house and her grandmother made them go all the way to the creek along with my great aunt and fill up buckets for water the next day. Now there was this lady who was born mentally challenged and during a time where people in the area didn't have adequate medical care and weren't knowledgeable with how to deal with people like that, they kept things to themselves and tried to handle it as best they could. There was no social support system. The social support system was the family. This woman was born to a couple in the area, and as they grew, she noticed that she wasn't right. So they pretty much left her to fend for herself. She would go in the woods and literally became an animal with long fingernails and long hair and bloodshot eyes. But she could imitate a panther perfectly. Food was something she could get, which pretty much amounted to children so she developed a hankering for human flesh. 
People in the community told their children after a few were lost to not take too long at the creek. So my maternal grandmother and great aunt went to the creek one night and about the time they made it back, this woman, or what could loosely be described as a human being at most, stuck her head out from the tree and looked at them and made a panther call. It was the first and last time they saw her. This happened around November of 2019, and a few friends and I were playing online and chatting over Discord, which we did on a regular basis. We only knew each other by our call signs then, so the people involved were myself, Whisk, and Zet. For those of you who may not know, Discord is an app that you can have on your phone or computer that lets you talk to people, kind of like a group call. We used to talk when we played video games and such, but anyway, we were playing some games and chatting at around 9 p.m. when Whisk suddenly mentions a noise at his window. He lives in the mountains of North Carolina, far away from any cities on his family land. So having something knocking at his window late at night, while not entirely disconcerting, was a bit strange. He dismisses it and mentions that it's probably just a bird. Then right as he does that, there's a loud crash and a roar. Zet and I are confused for a moment, and we hear some shuffling over the call. Whisk returns back to the phone and says he's all right, but he thinks an animal, perhaps a bear, just busted through his window, and he booked it to his bathroom and locked the door. He is sitting in the bathroom, talking to us on his laptop mic, while he plans to wait it out. We're hearing the roars and banging sounds through the call, and Whisk is trying to keep a cool head, but it's tense, and I try to distract him to keep him calm. We continue talking about things for a few hours, until about 11 p.m., and that is when things start getting strange. Whisk can hear voices from the other side of the bathroom door. Zet and I can hear them too, but we can't make out what they're saying. Then, Finally, we hear something clear along the lines of, come on out, you big baby, or some other taunt, in the voice of Whisk's cousin. I know what her voice sounds like. I've heard her on calls before, but she lives in a different house and would have no reason to be there at 11 o'clock at night. There are a few other voices, and Whisk is really getting scared. I do my best to keep him calm, but my own heart is racing at this point. The voices keep shifting between the monstrous sounds of roars and the heavy thuds on the wall until midnight. Zet and I both now start hearing a deep, gravelly voice with a strange echo talking to Whisk through the door of his bathroom. It says something along the lines of, don't mock me, as well as, I can't wait to taste your skin. It was talking over and over, and I was trying to talk over it, keeping Whisk focused on me. Set and I are both asking for his address, phone number, or anything so that we can call the police and get help. But he's scared out of his mind. This goes on for another hour or so until around 11. I didn't know what else to do, so I pick up my Bible and start reading out loud. Whisk sits and listens, and the strange voice on the other end of the call goes quiet. I read the Bible aloud until about 5 a.m. and I ask Whisk if he's all right. He says he is. Meanwhile, Zet stays quiet. Whisk informs me there's a car in the driveway, which he can see through a small fogged window in his bathroom. He flashes a light to the driver, his uncle, who always carries a hunting rifle in his vehicle. The thing is, whatever it was had gone quiet, and a few moments later, we heard the sound of gunshots over the call. Whisk says he's okay, and says goodbye. We head off to bed, and I sleep like a brick, exhausted. I later learned from Whisk that he peeked under the door during the call and looked at what was in the house. He couldn't see much of it but it sounded terrifying. Long arms, flesh, and skin hanging off the bone almost. A truly horrific sight. 
it trashed part of his house. We talk about it now and again, and Whisk still refuses to go into the woods or stay home alone. Honestly, I don't know what to make of this. I personally believe Whisk had a close call with something extremely dangerous, and I'm glad that there was some comfort when we stayed with him, even though we couldn't have been much help. The three of us have since become a lot closer, and we're always cautious of the things that live in the woods. I was camping up in Herber, Arizona, with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 or so at the time, and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. Me and my brother had our own tent, while my dad had a several one not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we're camping, and we would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at around 11. One night we were playing hide and seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something, since they were pretty common in our area, and we would typically go to our tent if we saw one in hopes of not agitating it. So that's what we did. I called for my youngest brother who was still hiding and he revealed himself to be hiding behind a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent and I decided since it was already pretty late that we should just go to sleep. The next morning I went to check the spot for elk prints since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead, I found large cat prints. I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad, as well as no claw marks. I was honestly kind of excited. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion or bobcat in the wild, but it never happened. Knowing that I was closer to either one was very thrilling. It then occurred to me that my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us, scarily close to the paw print location. It occurred to me that if that was a hungry mountain lion and it had taken notice of my six-year-old brother hiding alone, it may have possibly taken the chance. We stopped doing hide and seek at night to avoid these types of situations and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure everyone was together at night. Now I know a mountain lion likely wouldn't have done anything had it seen him, but still, the risk felt very real and I worry that had I not heard it, I could have lost my brother. One night, my best friend Joey and I were cruising Maine in our hometown, Bismarck. This was last summer. We got bored around 11 p.m. and I asked if he wanted to hike up to the Indian village lookout by the river, and he said sure. So we park at the bottom of the trail and start walking. Now this hike is probably a little under a mile and is pretty steep the whole way up on a paved walking trail. He was wearing dudes and I was wearing basketball style shoes. On the way up, he and I were making stupid jokes about the Native American ghosts trying to get us and stuff. We were trying to scare each other. Now, once you get to about 0.15 miles from the top, the rest of the hike gets even steeper and it's surrounded by a sort of small forest area. So it's pretty dark but I had a powerful flashlight. So we get to the top and enjoy the view of the river for a few minutes and then head back down. On the way down, we kept joking to each other that there was something behind us and neither was falling for it. So we get halfway down and Joey says to me, Logan, there's actually something behind us. And he sounded genuinely frightened, but I thought, yeah, right. So I shined my flashlight back for about two seconds because that's all I needed. And about a hundred yards behind us, there was a human height black figure with its eyes illuminated by the light. We both took off at a dead sprint down the hill. And a few seconds after he said, chill out, chill out, it's just a biker. And we waited for a few seconds, watching it slowly come towards us. And then he said, that's not a biker and we both took off running down the hill, probably a quarter of a mile to his car, and waited there for a good 15 minutes watching the trail when nothing came down. 
We drove up the road where you can look up the trail and saw nothing. I genuinely do not think it was a biker for a few reasons. It was a quiet night and we didn't hear anything. No bike noises, tire noises, nothing. Nobody's going to be riding their bike out at 11pm, and no one ever came down the trail. Like I mentioned earlier, that's a pretty steep hill, so someone isn't just going to turn around in the middle of going down it. We never saw any other people while going up, or at the bottom of the hill, so it wasn't another person. The only other logical explanation I can think of would be a deer, but there's no way that it was a deer because we saw it coming closer. Deer don't follow a person running away from them, and we never heard any noises in the grass or anything. It was just a very spooky experience to say the least. I've been doing my one hour of outdoor exercise at night because I find it most relaxing. My neighborhood is very quiet, and I'm lucky to live in a nice area which I've always considered super safe. I used to walk at night before lockdown because I live right next to a canal, so there's lots of nice paths that are super pretty at night, when everything is lit up by the moon. I was walking last night and decided to go to the shop first because I was hungry, and then detour back to my usual route along the canal. When I was walking, I heard two guys speaking super loudly in German. I live in the UK, so it was a bit unusual, but not anything I thought about twice. They looked around 30, pretty tall and had caps on, which I remember because they had matching designs, which I thought was funny. They started getting really close, and when I glanced back to look at them, they started jeering, so I knew they were looking at me, which kind of freaked me out, so I sped walked towards the shop. I had to stop at the road, as I wasn't planning on getting hit by a car. They caught up with me, but didn't stop for the lights to change, and just walked across and went to the store I was heading for. So I shrugged it off and walked towards the canal for my walk. I stopped thinking about the men soon after, chalking it up to me being a generally anxious person. I don't like walking past strangers at night, and I'm self-conscious enough as it is without them walking or talking to me. Anyway, I complete my walk and I'm heading home. For the story makes sense, I need to describe where I stood. On the right, there was the water itself, I'm stood in the middle of the path, and to my left, there's a big drop that goes straight to the main road. Next to the road, there's a row of houses, and a railway bridge in front of me. I have my earphones in, and my music is pretty loud, but I think I hear someone shouting. So I take out an earphone and listen, but it's pretty silent apart from the passing cars on the road below. That's when I see the two men heading towards the bridge, and I immediately recognize them as the two guys who had jeered at me before their caps. I stopped walking as my anxiety flooded back, and considered calling someone because I irrationally thought that if I'm on the phone as I walk past, they wouldn't annoy me. But despite the fact I've been standing for ages frozen, and no one comes out from under the bridge. I wait, staring at the bridge for a while in complete confusion, because there's no way they could have just vanished. I can see through the other side of the bridge, so I know they didn't just turn around or walk away or anything but they certainly hadn't walked through because no one passed me. After a few moments, I start to think I might have hallucinated them, despite the fact I have no history of this, and I started slowly walking towards the mouth of the bridge, and just as I'm about to step in I see it, the shadow of one of the men cast across the wall. My blood literally ran cold as I realized what was going on. They were waiting for me at the other side, but they must have hidden so that I wouldn't see them. My mind went to a million different places panicking about what they would do if I walked under the bridge. I was convinced they'd just follow me. If I stayed where I was and phoned for help, I was certain they'd come out to see what was going on and I'd be trapped. I did the only thing I could think of. I quietly ran to the fence that separated the canal path from the drop to the main road and climbed it. It was only about thigh height, and on the other side there was a small space before the wall and drop itself. I waited for a few moments as the cars passed, but thankfully I live in a quiet area that was relatively rural, and so the road was soon empty, and I managed to navigate myself so I could lower myself off the drop without A making too much noise or B hurting myself. I hit the road and raced to the other side where the houses were and sped walked down that path as fast as I could without making noise, only glancing back when I was nearing the end of the road. 
The men were still there next to the bridge, and I could see that they were looking through the bridge to see where I had gone. I felt sick and terrified, but I made it home. I don't know what they wanted. I don't know who they were, or if they'll be there again tonight. But I do know I'm not going to be walking for a long time after that. It's a strange bridge, man. Let's not meet. My partner and I were deep in Mount Adams Wilderness Area in Washington State, and there were no other camps around. We had spent the day fishing and exploring the creek around our camp, when at 2am he wakes me up and tells me to be quiet. Our little dog is growling quietly and looking in one direction. About 15 yards north of the tent, I can hear rustling and a woman's voice speaking quietly to herself, but couldn't discern any words. There's no light, just the voice and the walking noise. It goes quiet and then picks back up on the other side of the tent, which is even deeper in the woods and it fades off into the dense forest. My partner had literally grabbed his gun and was getting ready to confront them, but since it seemed to have moved on, nothing came of it. I cannot stress enough how deep these woods were. We had explored the day before, and I had scratches from twigs and branches. It was so dense. The fact that there was someone alone wandering around talking to themselves in the middle of the night without a light or camp is so freaky and I still get chills whenever I think about it. The next morning we investigated and didn't find any tracks, but there was a really haphazardly lit fire, charred remains in the middle of a forest slash logging road about a mile up, and was still kind of warm. I know there is a small town of about 150 people, a good 10 miles south of where we were camped, so maybe it was drunken teenagers. We were almost touching the Yakima Indian Reservation, and the logging roads were still actively used, but still, it was so bizarre. We live in the woods bordering a massive park system in Alberta. We have bears, lynx, moose, wolves, and cougars. The cougars, well, and moose, scare me more than anything out here. My husband and I were hiking an old hunting trail quite far into the park with our dog. The dog was super big, a Rottweiler slash Irish wolfhound and very well trained, who sadly passed away at a fairly young age. We'd been out hiking for about two hours and stopped for a rest on a fallen log. We'd been sitting for a few minutes when suddenly the dog starts, sits up, and stares intently into the dense brush bordering the path. After a minute, he jumps up and starts growling intensely, hackles up, standing between us and the brush. We don't see a thing, but we know there are cougars in the area, and not much else is so quiet and hidden out there. So we pack up and start hiking back. The dog is super relieved, and we're leaving, and walks alongside us, checking behind every so often. We hike back for 10 minutes or so and the dog stops again, staring behind us and starts growling loudly. We have bear spray but no gun, and we figure the cougar is following us now. So we keep hiking back, adrenaline high, bear spray out. It goes like that for roughly an hour, hike for a while, dog watching our back, and occasionally stopping to growl and snarl at whatever he senses that we don't. The dog stays tense the rest of the way back, and kept checking over our shoulder. But the last half of the hike back home, he didn't growl at anything else, at least. Still scared the crap out of us both, and we were super grateful that the dog stuck to us, instead of running off to chase the cougar, which ends in them being eaten, but was big and aggressive enough to keep the cougar at bay. I was camping in Northern California, at the very tippy top of California, deep in the woods at a reservoir. I had to go poop really bad early in the morning before the sun was up and there were no bathrooms. 
So I walked down the trail and found a little spot isolated away from the trail next to a blackberry bush and an outcrop of water from the reservoir. I heard some crashing in the tree line and it just started to become slightly light out. I peeked over the blackberry bush and not 40 feet away from me was a huge bear around 500 pounds. I tried to sneak away, but as I stepped back and I kid you not, I stepped on a twig that snapped. This bear and I both instantly turn our heads towards one another and lock eyes. I attempted to make myself look big and make noise, but the bear didn't budge. In fact, he started to walk towards me. So many things were racing through my mind. The number one being there's no way I'm curling up into a ball and allowing this monstrosity of a giant bear to mess with me. So I crouched down as low as I could behind the blackberry bush so he couldn't see me and started running as fast as I could while crouched and squatting down. My thought process was that if he couldn't see me run, maybe he wouldn't chase. If I was already kind of far away before he actually saw me running over the blackberry bush. It worked. He pursued around the blackberry bush for around 20 feet and decided it wasn't worth it and allowed me to escape. I honestly thought I was going to be breakfast for this bear and that would have been the end of me. I do wildlife photography, so go hiking every Sunday and have been doing this for about a year now. With the frequency I go hiking, it might be surprising that I've had two experiences, or maybe not. Both of these have taken place in the western part of Wisconsin. My first experience was at a semi-defunct state campground in the middle of summer. I say semi-defunct because there was a newer gravel parking lot by the gravel road and a gated off road leading deeper into what used to be a paved parking lot and paved RV and campsites. It's about a mile from the gravel parked lot to the paved lot and this walk goes just fine. The road continues past the paved lot for about a mile then splits into almost non-existent trails. It was after I got past the paved lot that things started to get strange. I started to get a weird feeling that was hard to describe. It just felt like wrong. Every step I took, I had the thought that I shouldn't take another step and that I should turn around. This feeling kept growing and growing in intensity until I got to the end of the road and just couldn't take it anymore and turned and went the way back because I had the strongest feeling that if I went on a trail, something very bad would happen. The walk back to the gravel lot was just fine. And by the time I got to the lot, the feeling was completely gone. And I looked for a gates on the gravel road. The second one I will say I think was probably a deer, but I'll let you decide. This hike was in the early fall. I went off trail down a gully and followed a small creek. All in all, it was a good hike until I rounded a bend and saw a cave. My initial thought was to go check it out. Then that nagging feeling was like, no, something bad is in there. I was admittedly thinking more along the lines of a homeless person. As soon as I turned away, I had the same being watched feeling so many people describe and I had to just get out of there. So I backtracked my steps and was about two miles into the hike when the feeling suddenly got much, much stronger. Eyes darting all over the place, I was literally almost walking sideways on the trail. And then all of a sudden there was a huge crash behind me. I didn't see anything before or after the crash. This is where I think it might have been a deer, but I didn't see anything. The feeling intensified all the way until I got into my car and locked the doors. It got better as I collected myself in the car. I don't know how to explain these. Could just be an overactive fight or flight response, but they stick out to me from all my other experiences. And I can't help but think of them. Let me know what you think. Back in high school, the only place to be alone was a spot my boyfriend and I scoped out in the middle of the woods. It required driving out to a pretty remote area via long dirt roads many miles from town. 
opening a very heavy gate and then driving a few miles on a narrow one-lane dirt road to a dead-end clearing by the lake. Then you could par and neck, as the kids say. A lot of the other teens knew about it, but the spot and path could only be used by one car at a time. One night we drove out, opened the fence, drove past our spot, and I remember that there was no moon that night, so the only illumination was our headlights. We park and start to do our thing, when I start to get a really strange feeling. I told him I was feeling weird, and he agreed that it was a little extra creepy without the moon. So we turned the car back on and drove back out the way we came. We did not come across any other cars or see any other vehicles. On the way back, we were driving slowly in silence, with just our headlights lighting up the trees. When on the right side of the road, I saw a figure dressed entirely in white. He was just standing there with no flashlight, standing on the side of the road. He could have touched the car as we went by. That's how close I spotted him. Convinced I was just crazy, I said nothing. But when we got back to the fence, it was closed and latched. Someone had closed it behind us. Whoever it was had to have been on foot because there was no car and no one on the dirt lane road. On foot, in the middle of the woods, with no light. My poor high school boyfriend just about crapped himself but bravely got out, flung the fence open, got back in the car trembling, and we got back to his parents' house. And I finally blurted out that I saw a man on the side of the road. He blanched out saying, and he was wearing all white robes, right? He said he saw him too. He agreed that if the man had a flashlight or any kind of light source, he would have seen it a mile away, down the straight dirt path. He said he saw the man watching us in the rear view mirror as we drove away, just standing, watching. Neither of us could figure out what happened that night. We've been there a dozen times, and nothing like that has ever happened again. We'd been out there a dozen times and nothing ever happened, but we've never been back, nor spoke of it again. My wife and I enjoy hiking, camping, and just being out in nature. We aren't experts or even heavy hobbyists by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something we like to do a few times a year. About three and a half years ago, we decided to go on a spontaneous overnight trip in the forest we live near. We know the trails well, and it's pretty popular, so we didn't do much planning. Just figured we'd go and find a nice spot and enjoy some time alone. We drove the trails, parked, and began our hike. A little over a mile or so in, we discovered a minor trail leading away from the main one. We decided to head that way and explore some. Eventually, taking a deer trail down to the lake. We went around a few coves and eventually found a nice lakeside spot to set up. So at this point, after a slew of bad decisions, we're set up. Everything is great until the next morning when we pack up and head the way we came. I guess we got mixed up and went up the wrong hill because after an hour, we realized we were totally lost. No trails, no landmarks, nothing. We went the way we thought would take us back to the trails for seven hours. No food, ran out of water, and we're basically screwed. Fast forward a bit, and we finally hit level ground, so take a rest. A few minutes in, however, I look up and out of the corner of my eye, I see someone pass behind a tree and disappear. Now, it was probably my mind messing with me, considering the circumstances, but regardless, it spooked the carp out of me. Enough so that I grabbed my wife's hand and led her in the opposite direction. Within a few minutes, we're suddenly on the trail that we hadn't noticed before, heading us to a graveyard that marks the end of the main trail. A couple of miles later, we reached the car and went home. Now, chances are it wasn't paranormal, but something about how it all ended up working out and the fact that we stumbled across the trail leading to the graveyard had always stuck with me. Not the scariest encounter, I'm sure, but an interesting experience, to say the least. Me and my now ex-girlfriend used to go to local parks late at night. 
We'd just walk the trails and talk about whatever was on our minds. We lived in a small town, had three parks in the area almost completely to ourselves late at night. The cops never bothered us, and no one else in the area thought of going to the park at midnight. It was around 1am one night that we used to frequent. The park has a four plus mile nature trail that winds and bends. We've walked it a few times before the whole way and back and never seen anything too out of the ordinary, but a few surprises, such as walking up on a herd of deer that were sleeping and the occasional coyote, which runs away once it sees our flashlight. We were walking the trail about a mile in when we both heard a horrendously loud crash and both nearly crapped ourselves and caught with the flashlight a large, probably 30 foot tall pine tree falling over 20 feet away from us. After about 10 minutes of silent listening and trying to calm ourselves down, we came to the conclusion that it must have possibly been weakened, like by some natural cause, and continued walking for another half hour or so. We started talking about other things, almost forgetting that the tree fell, when another tree, this time an oak, about 40 feet tall fell right next to us. This one was easily 10 feet from us and we noped out of there and both ran for our lives back to my truck. If you've ever heard a tree fall fully intact, it's an awfully eerie sound. The ripping and groaning of the roots being pulled from the earth, followed by the deep concussive thump of the tree hitting the ground. All this happening in the middle of the night by the light of an old flashlight within a few seconds. For the record, there wasn't any wind that night, and from what I could recall, the ground was not wet or anything like that. I went back to where the trees fell during midday a few days later, and saw that they both looked to be perfectly healthy trees. Both trees fell away from us almost perfectly, no obvious signs of foul play and about a week later, the park service cut the trees up and removed them from the park. My girlfriend was always uncomfortable talking about that night and would always change the subject. And we eventually separated a few years. My girlfriend and I were terribly freaked out about it for a while and led to our late night park excursions ending. Just the odds of it happening must be almost astronomical, right? two different species of trees that were a very large distance and quite apart from each other and that happened to fall as we were very near them. And the guy who would try and find any plausible explanation. But that night has bothered me over the years from time to time. I truly wonder if there is something else more sinister behind it. Last summer, me and my brother took a walk through the woods at Silver Falls State Park in Oregon. The forests were beautiful and cool, so we figured why not, and took a path into the trees. We were pretty far down the path when it happened. Our cabins were far out of view and out of earshot, and we had just turned a corner and began going up the side of a cliff when my brother froze. I asked him what was wrong and he was near tears when he told me he wanted to go back. We jogged back to the cabins and he told me he saw a black streak that was in the shape of a human, with a long nose, bald head and skinny limbs, dashing silently through the trees. I've never seen my brother in this state. He was crying and shaking. I've been thinking about it. Could it have been a cryptid? Maybe whatever it was, if it wasn't just my brother's imagination. It's what snatches people up in the blink of an eye in missing 411 cases. I want to add that it was definitely no jogger or fellow camper. I spoke to my brother again and he described it in the same way. Shorter, black, human shaped, running silently past before vanishing completely behind a tree. We ventured back to the spot a little later and saw nothing. 